Hi everyone, I'm Trish Connor Cato. Welcome to Analyzing Data with SQL Server Reporting Services, also referred to as SSRS. This video course is for those who will be the administrators of SSRS and who need to create dynamic paginated reports using the reporting tools. You'll also learn the SSRS administrative tasks during the course. When we begin the course, there is a Word document in the video description that I will review with you before we get started into the course. In this Word document, you'll find all the requirements, software requirements necessary to get your system ready for this course, as well as the links and instructions to download and configure software as necessary. Module 1 will introduce you to SSRS, its components, and its tools. This lesson is informational and will not require any hands-on activities. The subsequent modules are informational and hands-on. In Module 2, you'll learn about the data sources that are compatible with SSRS, their connection strings, and how to create both a data source and a data set. We will be creating them in both Report Designer via Visual Studio 2019 and Microsoft Report Builder. Module 3 is where you will begin to create paginated reports, again, in both applications. You'll learn how to create reports from scratch as well as by using the report wizard. You'll also learn how to publish reports. Module 1 is an introduction to reporting services. This module has three lessons. The first lesson is the introduction. The second one will cover reporting services components and lesson three will cover reporting services tools. Again, this module requires no hands-on interaction. SQL Server Reporting Services provides a set of on-premises tools and services that create, deploy, and manage mobile and paginated reports. The SSRS solution flexibly delivers the right information to the right users. Users can consume the reports via a web browser, on their mobile device, via email, or even through a file share. Paginated reports allow you to create modern looking reports with updated tools and new features for creating them. The reason why they're known as paginated reports, a lot of reports nowadays are transmitted online in the cloud. Paginated reports gives you the ability you can save them as a Adobe PDF or some other type of file and they're printable. The new mobile reports with the responsive layout adapts to different devices and the different ways you hold them. So your different phones, your different tablets, and you have a modern web portal you can view in any browser. In the new portal, you can organize and display mobile and paginated reporting services reports and KPIs. You can also store Excel workbooks on the portal. Lesson two is about reporting services components. So the components are Report Designer. It's a robust tool that's designed for data professionals. It can be run from SSDT, that's SQL Server Data Tools or as an add-on to Visual Studio. It generates report definition language files, known as RDL files, that control how reports will look and act. You also have Report Builder. It's a more straightforward tool designed to enable end users to create reports. It also generates RDL files. Reporting Services component takes RDL files as input and uses them to render the SSRS reports. And you have your web portal, which is used to manage, secure, and run the reports. This third and final lesson is reporting services tools. The tools have been broken down into three groups. You have tools for report authoring, tools for report server administration, and tools for report content management. The tools for report authoring include the SQL Server Mobile Report Publisher. It also includes PowerView, which is an interactive data exploration and visual presentation experience. 
It lets you create and interact with reports based on analysis services tabular modules. And then we have both report designer and report builder listed on this slide. They happen to be both components of SSRS as well as report authoring tools. Now we'll review the tools for report server administration. There are two different modes. There's native mode and SharePoint integrated mode. We'll tackle native mode first. So a report server configured for native mode runs as an application server that provides all the processing and management capability exclusively through reporting services components. You can use SQL Server Management Studio or the web portal to manage reporting services reports. A reporting services native mode installation consists of several server-side features that you will need to manage and maintain. They include the following, the report server web service, the background processing applications, and the report server database. Now I have a table here listing some of the tools that you'll use for administering in native mode. So you have Report Server Configuration Manager, which we'll be using later in this course. We'll be using SQL Server Management Studio. You have an RS Config utility, uh, RS Key Management utility, and Windows Management Instrumentation classes discussed on this table as well. So if you're using SharePoint integrated mode, you must use the content management pages on the SharePoint site to manage reports, shared data sources, and other report server items. Now I'm listing this in the slide deck. And by the way, this slide deck is also included in the video description, but we're not going to be going into SharePoint integrated mode during this course, but I just wanted to introduce you to it. It would be an add on that you would have to download in order to be able to use these tools. So there's SharePoint central administration and PowerShell could be used as well for access. And finally, we have the tools for report content management. So this would be your report server web service URL, the web portal and the RS utility. Um, which is a script host you do from the command prompt. So the web portal, by the way, is for native mode only, not for SharePoint integrated mode. And it's used to administer a single report server instance from a remote location over an HTTP connection. Now, before we get into the next modules, which are all hands-on, we're going to review for a moment the software requirements. So I have this slide in the deck, but I'm actually going to bring up a Word document named Software Requirements that is in your video description to review with you. So this document is listing all of the components that you're going to need to be able to be hands-on in this course. So it doesn't really matter what version of SQL Server you have. There may be some differences with earlier versions, but I have this document set up with all the tools that you're gonna need and links to where you can download these things. So there's a download for SQL Server 2019, which is what I'm running. The SQL Server database engine, you can get that from within a workload in Visual Studio, and you're gonna need that in order to configure your report server. You're gonna need SSRS, SQL Server Reporting Services. There's a download link there. We're also gonna be using Visual Studio. I'm using the Professional 2019 version, and there's a link there where you can get the download. It also, when you're doing that install, you're going to select the SS, DT, SQL Server Data Tools workload during the installation of Visual Studio. Once we start using Visual Studio, there are a few other extensions that we're gonna want and we'll get those from within Visual Studio and I'll guide you through how to get those extensions. You're also gonna need Microsoft Report Builder. There's a link to the download. 
There's SQL Server Management Studio, another link to the download. There's a section there, Configuration Help. If you're configuring and administering your report server in native mode, that will guide you through the process. You're going to need to download the SQL Server Mobile Report Publisher. And you're going to want to download the Power BI mobile app, which you can do from your mobile device from any app store, whether it's uh, Android or Apple. With that, you're also going to need a Power BI account. Power BI has a free account that you can use. It needs to be a work or school account, but that would work for our purposes. And then we talked about SharePoint integrated mode, and there's a link. If you're going to want to use that, you're going to want to grab the add-in. So there's a link to the add-in for that. I have a few other things on this document, which we'll reference later. But for right now, those are the main components that you're going to need in order to be able to be hands-on throughout the rest of this course. Module 2 is about reporting services data sources. We have three lessons in this module. We're going to talk about the available data sources for SSRS. You're going to learn in lesson two about connection strings. And in lesson three, we will start creating our data sets. Before we get into this lesson, there is a wide world importers database as a file in the video description. And I need you to grab that and move it to the specific directory on your C drive. So I'm showing you this directory in Windows Explorer and you need to have that database. That's gonna be the database that we're using for this course. It's a generic freeware database called Wide World Importers. It's customers, products, sales, orders, all of that kind of stuff in that database. So that's the path that you want to copy that Wide World Importers dash full dot back file into that particular directory. Our first lesson in this module is data sources. And on this slide, there are some of the data sources that are available that can be used within SSRS. So SQL Server is one of them. You have Azure SQL databases, Oracle, SharePoint list, all different kinds of data sources that can be accessed from SQL Server reporting services. And we're going to be focusing on data sources in this lesson. So you also have, in addition, custom data processing extensions and standard Microsoft.NET framework data providers that can be installed and registered by system administrators. You also have on this slide some information and a couple of links. The middle box says many third-party standard.net framework data providers are available as downloads and there's a link to the Microsoft Download Center there and also from third-party sites. It gives you some information that you can search the SQL Server Reporting Services Public Forum for information about third-party data providers and then there's a link on the right side of the slide where you can get all the information about all the data sources that are currently being supported. So when it comes to setting up a data source, you have to use a connection string. So you have to create a connection string to your data source. And on the right side of this slide, there's an article that gives you all the information you will ever need about creating data connection strings and important information related to data source credentials. But a data source includes the data source type, connection information, and the type of credentials to use. So we're going to be getting to that. We're going to start with data sources, move into setting up our data sources by using connection strings. And then the third lesson in this module, we will be creating our data sets. So each data set represents the result set from running a query command on a data source. The columns in the result set are the field collection. 
The rows in the results set are the data. A data set does not contain the actual data. It contains the information that is needed to retrieve a specific set of data from a data source. Then there are two types of data sets, embedded and shared. An embedded data set is defined in a report and used only by that report. A shared data set is defined on the report server and can be used by multiple reports. And you'll get examples of all of these during the course. In Report Builder, you can create shared data sets in shared data set mode or embedded data sets in Report Designer mode. In Report Designer and SQL Server data tools, you can create shared data sets as part of a project or embedded data sets as part of a report. And then you have a link on this slide as well with additional information from Microsoft. So now we're ready to get hands on. The first thing we're going to need to do is get a connection to that wide world importers database that you move to that specific directory on your hard drive. So I'm going to use SQL Server Management Studio to do this. I just typed SSMS in the search bar and it comes right up. So I'm going to launch that. If you've configured your report server, when you go into SQL Server Management Studios, you'll see this connect to server splash screen. It has my database engine there. There's all different types of engines that you can get to or services that you can get to. I'm leaving it on database engine. It has my server name and it has my authentication already there. So I'm gonna click connect and it will take me into SQL Server Management Studio. And I don't need this section on the side to be as wide as it is. So I just decrease the width of it. And if you have a registered servers box up there, you can close that. We really just need Object Explorer in here for this part. So now that we're in here, we have to connect to the database that we saved into a program files directory. And it's a backup of the wide world importers database. So in the object explorer, if I expand databases, I won't see wide world importers there. We have to make that happen. I'm going to collapse databases, right click on it and choose restore database. When you get into the restore database, dialog box, you're going to select device under source and to the right of device, you're going to click the ellipsis button. So it's looking for backup devices. So we got to give it the backup media. We're going to choose add on the right and it should take you directly to your backup folder where we stored wide world importers dash full dot back. So mine is stored in a slightly different directory than yours because I have multiple instances of things on my computer, but it's still in a backup folder. So there's the wide world importers backup. And at the bottom, I'm going to click OK. So it brings it here under backup media and I'm going to click OK again. And now at the top, it says ready. All right. When you click OK at the bottom, it's going to start restoring the backup. So you'll see that progress in the yellow band going across the top. When it's completed the process, you'll get a pop up letting you know that it restored the database successfully and you can click OK on that pop up. Now, if you look in your list of databases, we have the wide world importers database. If you expand it, and then expand the tables folder, you'll see all of the different tables in that database. Now, this is about SQL Server reporting services. This course is not really about SQL queries. So what I've done is I've already created the queries that we're gonna use in this course. So we can go ahead and collapse wide world importers. 
it doesn't have to be collapsed. That's just my OCD speaking here. And what we're going to do is we're going to bring up a new query window here that tells it to use the Wide World Importers database. So you can either click the new query button up here on the toolbar, or I just do control and the letter N to bring up a new query window. I'm gonna go ahead and go into code snippets. There's another folder in there, SQL. You can leave that just like it is. I'm just gonna put it in the root of code snippets. And I'm gonna name it drill through query. And then save. So now we're gonna do a, another new query. So I'm gonna do control N I think I did it twice, so I've got two new query windows here. But on the second one, I'm going to go back over to the code Word document. And I'm going to copy the next query. And we're going to name this one main query. And you can save it in your code snippets. So go ahead and copy it. Go over to your SQL Server Management Studio, paste it. You always want to test it, so go ahead and F5 to execute it, and then save that one as main query. So you have seven more queries in here, starting with the map query. Again, you're not selecting the text, and I'm going to have you get the rest of these into SQL server management studio, and you want them each on their own query window. So new query for each one of these, go ahead and get those in. At the end of the day, you'll have nine total queries in there. So when you're done, you'll have nine tabs. If you don't see all of the tabs, there is a drop down arrow all the way over in the upper right hand corner of your query tabs that you can use to access the rest of your query windows. So if you can't see all of them, you can do the drop down and you'll see all of your query windows. And when I was pasting the queries in, I was running each one. So I have results for each one at the bottom. So now that we have our database restored and we have our queries running here, we're about ready to set up our data source. And we're gonna do that in our web portal. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to go to the search box and I'm gonna type report, start typing report and the report server configuration manager application should come up. So I'm gonna go into there and it needs me to sign in. So I'm gonna go ahead and connect. And when you went through to set up your report server, you use the report server configuration manager in native mode. And one of the things that you get in here is on the left, you have your web service URL, but you also have your web portal URL. And that's where we want to go. So I actually have my web portal URL saved in my browser. So it comes up automatically. But if you don't know how to get to it, this is your starting point. So I can click this link here and it's going to require me to go ahead and sign in so I can get into the site. Finally got my credentials right. So it takes me into our web portal. So notice here when I went in, let me, go over here to this tab. So I would have to refresh this tab. This is my default tab that comes up. But when I opened my browser earlier, I didn't sign in. So it's just blank there. I'll just close that. But this is your web portal. And from here, we're going to create a data source. So just a quick overview of your web portal. In the upper left hand corner, you have, this is a link, it'll take you back to home if you click it. This is your name of the component, SQL Server Reporting Services. You have a favorites tab. We don't have anything in here. You can mark items in here as favorites and then get to them from the favorites tab. 
And when you go to browse, you're on the home page. There's another link to home there. On the right hand side, you have a series of icons. You have new upload manage folder tiles. And to the right of that, you have a search box. So you can quickly search for items that are stored in your web portal. Above all of that, you have a gear icon and that is like getting to your settings in here. So you have the gear icon, you have a download icon and you have a help question mark as well as your user that signed into the web portal. So what we want to do first is we want to create a folder in here that will contain all of the stuff that we're going to be doing during this class. So we're going to go to the new button and choose folder. It gives you a little warning there that, you know, can't contain any of the following characters. So we're going to just name it SSRS and we'll just call it video course and create the folder. So to take a moment to show up on your home page, and when it does, you notice it gave it a heading of folders. We have one folder up here so far, and we're going to click on that folder to get into the folder. So this is where now in the upper left, it says SSRS video course. That's the folder you're in. If you wanted to go back to home, you could do that link underneath it to get back to the home page. I'm going to go back into the folder. So we're ready to set up our first data source using the appropriate connection string. So we're going to go back to new and this time at the bottom, we're going to click on data source and it brings you to the new data source screen. So the name again, it can't contain any, you know, interesting characters and we're going to name it shared sales information. I'm not using spaces or anything. Because we're creating it in our web portal, it will be accessible to any of the reports that we're going to be doing. So it's a shared sales information data source. And if you look down, we don't have to put a description in. We could put created for the SSRS video course, sales information from wide world importers database. If you wanted to, you could come in here at some point and hide the data source. We're going to leave that unchecked and we're going to leave it checked that it's enabled. You could either hide it and disable it or just hide it and have it enabled, so on and so forth. They're check boxes. For your connection type, if you do the drop down arrow, it's defaulting to SQL Server, and that's what we're going to be using. But you can see your other connection types listed in that drop down. And in the connection string, you have to type data source and then an equal sign. Now I've switched back over to SQL Server Management Studio just to show you this. This is what I have to put in for my next part of the connection string, the actual data source. In my case, it's going to be this win-ie2, no, 4uco3b, backslash evaluation. That's what I need to put in for mine. Whatever yours says there is what you're going to have to put in. So I'm going to go ahead and get that in there. And once I have that in, so it's connecting, right? Once I have that in, I have to tell it what actual database we're connecting to. And you do that after you get your information and you're going to type a semicolon and then you're going to type initial and casing doesn't really matter here. Typing does initial catalog equals and that's going to be the name of the database, which is wide world importers, no spaces in between. So once you have that in, that's your connection string, the type of connection string you use for Microsoft SQL Server data sources. 
Then we scroll down and under credentials, I'm going to choose the option button for using the following credentials. I'm going to leave it on my Windows username and password. And I'm going to go ahead and input my username and password. Once I do that, I'm going to want to test my connection. So click the test connection button and it will tell me it connected successfully. If you get a pop-up saying that it couldn't connect, make sure you double and triple check your data source that you listed there and make sure you have the semicolon after it. So once it's connected successfully, we're gonna choose create. So now you'll see your data sources. It has the category, we have one data source. It looks like the database icon and it says shared sales information. Now that we have our shared data source, we're ready to create our data set. You're actually gonna be creating the data set in Report Builder, but you can access Report Builder from within SSRS. So we're gonna go back to New, and we're gonna choose Data Set, and you're gonna get two pop-up boxes, even if you have Report Builder installed. So the bottom one says we're opening Report Builder and it lets you know if you run into issues, you'll need it installed on your computer and you have a link to get it right there. The top one is when you already have it installed, you can go ahead and click open to open the application. Because we chose new data set, it's on the new data set screen when it launches Report Builder. And we're gonna go down to browse other data sources. Now I have multiple training report servers. So I always like to browse and I wanna look in the correct one. So in this case, it's my training report server, just like that. It's in the SSRS video course folder. And there is our shared sales information data source, right? So you have to choose so I have a couple because I have, a, a, like I said, multiple servers going, but I want to make sure I have the correct shared sales information one already selected. And then I'm going to go to the bottom right and choose create. So it's asking me for my credentials and I'm going to go ahead and enter them. And I'm going to go ahead and save my password with the connection and click OK. and I'm going to maximize Report Builder. We're gonna use the main query that we put into SQL Server Management Studio. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna switch over to SQL Server Management Studio, and I'm gonna find my main query tab. Again, my object explorer window doesn't need to be that wide. So I'm looking for main query. I'm going to just go to the drop down in the far right, switch to main query. I'm going to click anywhere within the query itself and do control A, C to select it and copy it. And then I'm going to switch back over to report builder. Now that I have the query copy to my clipboard, on the ribbon in Report Builder, you're going to click on Edit as Text. And in the text box, you're going to just do Control V to paste that query in there. Now, if we want to make sure that it's going to work, there's a Run button, the red exclamation point on the toolbar. You can click that and you'll see the query results on the bottom of the screen. Now we need to save our data set. So we're gonna go up to the save icon on the quick access toolbar in the upper left corner. And notice that it's putting you in your report server. And we're gonna save this data set inside the SSRS video course folder. And we're gonna call it sales info. And save it. So just to recap, so far, we created a shared data source in SSRS, and then we launched Report Builder from within SSRS to create our data set 
The shared data source, we used a connection string for Microsoft SQL Server, and we connected it to the Wide World Importers database that we already restored. And then we did our data set, which is based off of the results of a query from SQL Server Management Studio. Now we're gonna do this process, but just using a different tool all over again. So what I'd like you to do is go ahead and launch Visual Studio. And when it's launched on the right side, underneath all of those tiles, your choice is there. You're gonna click on the link that says continue without code. And it opens Visual Studio and I just maximized it. So on the software requirements Word document we looked at earlier, there were three extensions that we needed to add once we got into Visual Studio. So I'm gonna just walk you through that. If you look up at your menu bar at the top, you're gonna click on extensions and then manage extensions. So there are three different things that we want to have in here. And I already have these extensions. So you're gonna scroll through, I'm looking at the Visual Studio Marketplace on the left. You're gonna scroll down until you see SQL Server Integration Services Projects. And that's an extension you're gonna want to add. So when you click on it, you'll get the download button and you can do that. The next one is Microsoft Reporting Services Projects. You wanna download that as well. And if I scroll down, let's see if I do have the third one in here. SQL Server, Microsoft. And there's the third one, Microsoft Analysis Services Projects. So you want Microsoft Analysis Services Projects, Microsoft Reporting Services Projects, and SQL Server Integration Services Projects. Those are the extensions that you're gonna want in your Visual Studio. So go ahead and get those set up. And when you're done, you can just close the Manage Extensions box. You'll get a green check mark when you have those extensions enabled. Now that we have our extensions installed, we're gonna go up to the File menu, hover over New, and click on Projects so we can create our project file. When we get in here, you're gonna click in the Search for Templates box, and you're gonna type the word Report, and you'll see the list starts to populate. And what we want is a Report Server Project. So I'm gonna click on Report Server Project, and I'm gonna choose Next. Now notice where it's storing this information. It's storing it in your local C drive, right? And so this is different than it's storing it in our web portal, in SSRS. So we're gonna name this Sales Information, and at the end of it, I'm gonna put a capital V, capital S, so we know that we did this one in Visual Studio. We're gonna leave the checkbox, place solution and project in the same directory checked, and we're gonna click the Create button on the lower right corner. So if you take a look on the right side of your screen, your Solution Explorer window or panel should be open at the top. Properties could be open on the bottom. If you go to your View tab on the menu bar, if your Solution Explorer is not open, you can grab it from there. And the same with your Properties window. If you need that to be open, you can grab it from the View tab if it doesn't open automatically. In your Solution Explorer, you'll notice that it says Solution Sales Information VS One of One Project. We've just created one project file, right? And so then it gives us the name of the file, again, Sales Information VS. Underneath it, it has three folders, Shared Data Sources, Shared Data Sets, and Reports. All of them are empty. It's not pulling in the shared data source that we did in SSRS. It's not pu pulling in the shared data set that we did in Report Builder. We're recreating those steps just using a different way of doing it via Visual Studio. Now we're ready to create a shared data source in here. So in Solution Explorer, you're gonna right click on shared data sources and choose add new data source. 
So we're going to give it a name. We're going to call it shared sales information and at the end VS. So we know we did this one in Visual Studio. For the type in here, it defaults to Microsoft SQL Server Analysis Services. If you have that installed, we're going to just do the drop down and select Microsoft SQL Server. And we have to put in our connection string here. And because it's Microsoft SQL Server, it's the same connection string that we used in SSRS. So we're going to do data source equals, and then you have to put in your connection information. And then after that, a semicolon, and it's going to be initial catalog equals wide world importers, the name of our database. Now in here, you have to go on the left side, you have to go to the credentials tab. I'm going to choose use this username and password, and I'm going to go ahead and populate that information. And I'm going to click OK. So now you'll see under shared data sources in Solution Explorer, we have our shared sales information VS. It's just a connection to our database. So I mentioned earlier that we had two different report authoring tools that we're going to be using. Report Builder, we've already been in. When you're working in Visual Studio, you're in Report Designer, and that's where we're at now. So now we're going to create a shared data set in here by right-clicking on Shared Data Sets in Solution Explorer and choosing Add New Data Set. So we're going to name this Sales Information VS. And we're using our shared data source that we created just a little while ago. And we're going to go down into the query box and I'm going to do control V to paste because I still had the main query from SQL Server Management Studio on my clipboard. In here, that's all we have to do when we're setting this up. So we're going to click OK at the bottom. Now you may get this message, unable to connect to data source. If you click OK on that message, it brings up the entering data source credentials. And what you have to do here is you have to check the box underneath the password that says use as Windows credentials, then go ahead and click OK. And now you have your shared data set. Notice the icon differences. The data source looks like a database. The data set kind of looks like a spreadsheet with columns or something. So we've created a shared data source and data sets in both Report Builder and now in Report Designer via Visual Studio. So we've completed module two. And just to recap what we've done, we created data sources both in SSRS and in Visual Studio. So two different vehicles to get the same end result. You learned about the connection strings and there's different connection strings for different data sources. We use the identical connection string because we're using SQL database in both Report Builder and Visual Studio. And then we created data sets in both Report Builder and Visual Studio. Now we get to start creating paginated reports in module three. There are three lessons in this module. In the first lesson, we'll create a report with the report builder report wizard. Second lesson, we're going to create a report and report designer via Visual Studio. And in lesson three, we will be going over publishing reports. So I switch back over to report builder and closed out of the data source. And you can go to File. If you're still in your data source, that's fine. You saved it. You can go to File New, and you'll get the new report or data set splash screen. So we want to use a wizard here. 
When we accessed Report Builder from SSRS, it only brought us to the new data set screen because from the new dropdown in SSRS, we chose data set. Now you're seeing what it looks like when you're not accessing it from SSRS. So we're going to choose the table or matrix wizard. We want to use a wizard for this first report. So I'm going to click on table or matrix wizard, and then I have to choose a data set. So what I'm going to do, if it defaulted to create a data set down at the bottom, you want to do the option button in front of choose an existing data set. If your data set is not showing there, you're going to click on browse and you're going to go into your correct report server into the SSRS video course, and you can grab your data set from in there. And then we're going to do next. So this first screen that you get to after that is arrange the field. So it has a list of the available fields in the data set and there's some default behaviors. So any numerical field is automatically going to want to make a value field if you double click it in the available fields list. And the other fields will automatically want to be row groups when you double click them in the available fields list. So we're going to just, you'll see how this behavior works and there's more than one way of doing it, of course, because it is a Microsoft product. So we're going to double click on Hmm. Let's double click on order date in a, under available fields and it automatically puts it in a row group, which is where we want it to be. You can also drag and drop into those boxes. So we're going to drag order ID from available fields and drop it into row groups underneath order date. So when you're putting stuff in row groups, it means it's going to group first by order date, then by order ID. That's what we're saying to do there. Then we have some value fields. Oh, you know what else to put in there? Um, double click stock item name and make that go into row groups as well. And then we're going to go to values. We want to populate the values box and we want to populate values with, you can double click quantity and transaction amount. And notice they both default to sum. To the right of each of them in the values box, you have a drop down arrow so you can change the aggregate function that's being used. We're going to leave them on sum. And we're going to choose next. So let's talk about the options on this choose the layout screen. We're going to leave it check to show subtotals and grand to totals. And we're going to have it in the blocked with the subtotal below layout, the default there. We are going to uncheck expand collapse groups on that screen. So let's talk about this preview and what it's showing you here. So the first row will repeat once for the table, just to show column headings. The second row will repeat once for each order date, order ID combination and display the item name, order quantity and transaction amount. The third row will repeat once for each order ID to display the subtotals. So this is the third row here. Then you have the fourth row will repeat once for each order ID to display the subtotals per day, per date. And then the fifth row will repeat once for the table to display the grand totals. So this first total that you see in row three, that one is going to repeat once for each order ID to show your subtotals. The next total in row four is going to repeat once for each order ID to display the subtotals per date. And then the last total will show at the end of the report and it will display the grand total. We're going to go ahead and choose next. So you get a preview again, and you can go ahead and click finish on your preview. And for some reason it switched me over to SSMS. So I'm going to fix that. Now, before we run this report to see what it looks like, we're going to just do a few little formatting things, especially for our numbers and our date. So that's what we're going to do right now. So the first thing we're going to do on the home tab, 
in the number group, I'm going to have you click on that one, two, three button. And we're going to choose sample values because it defaults to placeholders. And when you're formatting your numbers, you're going to want it to show you some sample values at that point. So you see that the format looks correct. So we change that to sample values. And now what we're going to do is we're going to select the transaction amount fields in rows two through five. So I'm going to click on the first transaction amount. I can hold down my shift key and click on the other three transaction amounts in rows two through five is what we want to have selected. And on the home tab in the number group, we're going to do the dollar sign. So we get the currency format and you'll see the sample value now, right? So it's always going to be that one, two, three, four, five. So we see the sample value instead of not being able to see it. And it has the currency format. So that's the first thing we're going to do here. We're going to also select our quantity fields in rows two through five. And in the number group on the home tab where it says default, you're going to do the drop down and just choose number. And then we're going to say we don't want any decimal places. So I'm going to use the decrease decimal button right underneath the number drop down to get rid of the two decimal places. Now dates always default to the date time format and we just want the date. So we're going to select the order date in row two. We want to grab the field, the order date field. So the box around it shows the whole field is selected. And in the number group, we're going to do the default drop down and select date. So you see how it gives us the 131 2000. It's just giving us the date and not a time there, right? And then what we can do is in that order date box where it has the date, we're going to right click to format the date to a different format. So we're going to right click and we're going to go to text box properties from the shortcut menu on the left side, click on number. Notice it's already on date because we changed it to date on the ribbon. We could have done the whole thing in here. So we changed it to date and now we have all of these different formats. So the format that we want might have to, let me see if I can find it here. Yeah. You might need to scroll down a little bit. We want the one that just says January 31st, 2000, and we're going to click okay. So by doing that in this view, you'll see that the column is not wide enough to support that date format. So you can put your mouse in the gray band at the top in between order date and order ID, click and hold and drag over to the right a little bit. So you see the full date. Now we'll do a little bit more formatting on this, but let's see what we have so far. So the first button on the home tab of the ribbon is the run button, or you could press F5, just like in SQL Server Management Studio. So I'm going to go ahead and run. And when it's done loading, I can see the data. There's our date format that we did, right? So each order date, order ID combination, gives us a total quantity, right? And the total transaction amount. So order ID one on January 1st, 2013, there's the total. Order ID two, there's the total. Now you can use this run tab on the ribbon to navigate. Let's go to the last page of the report. So all you're gonna see there is the report footer and I'm going to use the previous page button to go to the next to the last page. If I scroll down to the bottom of that page, you'll see your grand total. So after every day, you're getting a daily total, every line item in terms of order ID, order date combinations, you're getting totals. And you can go back to the first page. And we want to go back to design view, which is now the first button on the run tab of the ribbon. 
So I got a little ahead of myself and I deleted the text box, which was in the page footer. So I want to get rid of the whole footer. I want you to do it too. So we're going to just right click in a blank area and choose remove page footer. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to change the name of some of our column headings. So order date is just going to become date. I'm double clicking order and pressing delete. Order ID is just going to become ID. I just want stock item name to be name. So I'm going to adjust that. So stock item name, I'm just going to do it this way. Old school, just redo it. Quantity, we're going to change to QTY. So we don't need the whole word to show there. So QTY and transaction amount is just going to be amount. So we're adjusting our column headings so they're different than our query results, but that's fine. We just want them to read a little bit different. And because we did that, we are also going to decrease the width of our order ID field because it doesn't need to be as wide. So I'm using the gray band above it, putting my mouse between ID and name and dragging backwards a little bit. The name field we really want to expand. So the name shows. And we should expand the amount field just a little bit. I'm actually going to give some more to the name field. I'm going to expand quantity just a hair as well. So we have that resolved. And now what we need to do is get the report title as well as the header row, the column heading row to repeat on every page. So let's start with the report title. You want to select it so it has the sizing boxes all around it. And you need your properties window open on the right for this. If it's not open, you can go to the view tab of the ribbon and check the box in front of properties. So the properties are arranged in categories in alphabetical order. So you have action alignment, so on and so forth. We want to scroll down to the other category. And just so you know, when you have a table or a matrix, it is in what's known as a zone, and the zone is called a tablix, T-A-B-L-I-X. So we have one table in this report so far, so there's only one tablix in this report so far. And the reason why I'm mentioning that is because in the properties window, in the other group, let me make sure I reselect my header because it's not select it. So in the other group, there is a repeat with property. You're going to click in the text box to the right of repeat with and do its drop down arrow. And we want it to repeat with this table. So that is tablix one. So that's for the title. Now, unfortunately, we can't use the same method for the header row here. So what we're going to do is on the view tab of the ribbon, in the show hide, you're going to put a check mark in front of grouping and you get a grouping panel that opens on the bottom of your screen. So it's showing our order date, order ID, stock item names and row groups. To the right of column groups, there's a drop down arrow. Click it and click on advanced mode. So now if you look, you have a bunch of statics in your row and column groups. We're going to click on the first static under row group and it selects the very first field in the grid, right? The date field. So now we're going to use the property sheet for this. Notice at the top of the property sheet, it says it's a member of the table. It's a tablix member, that date field, that whole row, right? So in other, where repeat on new page is set to true, but we have to tell it to keep with group. So where it says none next to keep with group, we're going to do the drop down and select after. Both of those settings need to, if you just did repeat on new page and we ran it, it wouldn't repeat on new page. You have to tell it to keep it with the group as well. Now that we have that done, we can go to the drop down next to column groups again, click on advanced mode to get out of there. On the view tab, we can uncheck grouping. We'll leave our properties window open. And we're going to go back to the home tab of the ribbon and run the report again. So now if we go to the next page, you'll see both the report header 
and the first row, the header row from the table are repeating on every page. And I'm gonna go to the last page and just make sure, and then, you know, you gotta scroll up a little bit, maybe. Well, no, now I don't have to. So on the last page, I see my totals and their columns are wide enough to display them well. Let's go back to design view. And this would probably be a good time to save this report. So let's go up to the save icon on the quick access toolbar. We're gonna go into our SSRS video course folder. And we're gonna call this one, we'll call it sales info, and we'll just put RB for report builder, sales info report builder, and save. So we just created a paginated report in the form of a table using the report wizard in report builder. Now I'm back in report designer via Visual Studio and we're gonna recreate that same table report from scratch in this application. And you'll be able to see the differences as we go through. So what we need to do in Solution Explorer, we already have our project open, Sales Information VS. We have our shared data source, our shared data set. We're gonna right click on the reports folder and we're gonna hover over add. Now, if we go to add new report here, it will take us into its report wizard. We wanna create this one from scratch. So after you hover over add, you're gonna click on new item. It defaults to report and we're gonna name this report at the bottom. We're gonna name it sales info VS for Visual Studio and click add. So it gives us the canvas from which we can create our report. And so from this canvas, we're gonna right click, hover over insert and click on table. So now it opens up the data set properties dialog box where it says choose a data source and create a query. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna name this first. We're gonna name it table report from scratch. And we're gonna use our shared data set, which is sales information VS. And we're gonna click okay at the bottom. So it gives us the framework of a table and I'm gonna just move that framework to the upper left corner of that box inside the canvas, the page box. And we're gonna start adding our fields and everything here at this point. We're gonna be using the report data panel on the left side of your screen. If it's not showing, you can go to your view menu and all the way at the bottom, you can open it by clicking on report data. In the report data pane, you're gonna expand data sets. So you can see that even though we base this off of the sales information VS shared data set, we named it table report from scratch. And so we could have named it the same thing or anything different. I'm just trying to be specific for what we're doing here as well. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna use drag and drop for the fields that we want in this report. So we're gonna drag order date into the first column of the table. We're gonna drag order ID into the second column of the table. We're gonna grab stock item name and put it in the third column of the table. Now at this point you have some choices. I'm gonna show you the most efficient way of doing this because we have more table columns that we want to add here. So we could right click on the gray bar above stock item, hover over insert column and choose left or right. In our case, we would wanna choose right, but there's a more efficient way of doing this. So instead of inserting it, our next field that we're gonna want in the report is the quantity field. So I'm gonna grab the quantity field from report data pane and I'm gonna drag it over to the right of stock item and you'll see that blue guideline and it has a plus sign attached to your mouse. So when I let go, it 
creates the new column and puts the field in there. And then we have one more field we're going to add, which is transaction amount. So I'm going to drag that over to the right of quantity and drop it when I see the blue guideline. Now that we have our fields in, we're going to change our column headings just like we did in the other one. So we just want it to be date, ID, name. Next one, we're going to do QTY for quantity. And we're going to just have amount for the last one. So we're recreating the exact same report, just using Report Designer via Visual Studio, as opposed to Report Builder using the wizard. And we're doing this one from scratch. So we have our column headings, and now I'm going to resize the table. Kind of similar. We know what we want our column widths to be, kind of. I want to make sure that that stock item name column is pretty wide and increase the size of the amount column just a little bit. So we learned from how the data flowed in the other paginated report. Quantity might need to be widened just a bit as well. So, and notice it just, just like in Report Builder, it extends the framework for the page. So we have all of that stuff in there right now. So we're gonna take a moment to preview the report and I will tell you right now, when we go to preview it, you'll probably get an error. And I'll show you the simple fix for that error. So in here, we don't have run. You have, you're on the design tab, and then there's a preview tab to the right of it. So we're gonna do preview to preview the report. And of course, now it's not gonna give me the error. All right, so if you got an error, I still wanna walk you through what you would need to do to fix this. And this is on me. When we set up the shared data source, I made a mistake when we set that up. So I see a couple of things on my report that I'm gonna to need to change, like I didn't change it to QTY, it's QITY. While I'm in here, I'm gonna to navigate to the last page. So the right pointing arrow with the line on it. And I'm gonna scroll to the bottom. There's no totals. There's none of that stuff going on here. And there's no groupings. If I go back to the first page, we'll see that there's an, a line item entry for January 1st, 2013 for each order ID instead of just having one January 1st, 2013. So we're gonna have to do our groupings and stuff as well. Let's go back to design view. And I'll show you what to do if you got an error when you went to preview the report. So when we set up the shared data source, I'm in Solution Explorer. I'm going to double click that shared sales information VS data source. And I'm going to go to the credentials tab. So it's set to use this username and password. If you got an error, right, you would change it to use Windows authentication and then it would bypass an error. So if you went to preview it and you got an error, you need to change it to Windows authentication. I'm gonna leave mine the way it was and click okay. All right, so let's handle what we have to do next, our groupings. If your grouping pane is not open on the bottom of your screen, you can right click anywhere in the blank area and you can hover over view and click on grouping. And so we need to group by order date and then by ID in this grouping pane. Right now by default, and it will always have in the row groups equal details. So we're gonna use our report data pane on the left and we can drag and drop to from there to the row groups. So what we wanna do is we wanna drag order date and we wanna drag it down to row groups. You'll have a blue guideline and you want that guideline above equal details. So now your row group should look like mine. And something happened on your report layout, right? Now you have an order date field with brackets, if I click on it, you'll see the bracket in the row header, right? You actually have two date fields now. You have one, the grouping field, which we called order date. 
which is called order date. And then we have the one that we renamed date. And we will fix that in a moment after we get done with the rest of our grouping. So we want to drag order ID down and place it under order date and above equal details in row groups. So now we get another order ID field and that also is a grouping field, right? If I look at my table now, I'll see this double dotted line to the right of the order ID field. Anything to the left of that double dotted line is in a group. Anything to the right of it isn't. So what we need to do is we need to delete our original date and ID fields. So date and ID, we're going to delete those columns. And then we're going to rename order date, the grouped one to just date and order ID, the grouped one to just ID. And we can make that ID column not quite as wide. I'm going to go ahead and make my stock item name column a little bit wider and I'm going to correct my typo on QTY. So now this is how you manually do the grouping by using your grouping pane on the bottom of your screen and dragging and dropping. Now we're going to format our date and our value fields, our values fields, quantity and amount. So what you're going to do is you're going to right click. So in this second row where it has order date and brackets, that is known as an expression. We're going to right click on that expression field and we're going to choose text box properties. And we did this in report builder, right? In report builder, we actually changed it to a date format. And then we went in here and gave it a specific date format. So on the left side, we're going to click on number. We're going to choose date and we're going to find the format that says January 31st, 2000 and click OK. And now we're going to go over to our quantity field, our quantity expression, rather right click text box properties. We want this to be a number and we're going to choose number and we're going to take away the decimal places and click OK. And then for our transaction amount, we're going to right click on the expression and we are going to go to text box properties number, and we're going to select currency with two decimal places for this one and click OK. When we use the wizard in report builder, it was a box that defaults to be in checked where it included subtotals and grand totals because we're doing this from scratch. We have to do those manually and it's not very hard to do in here actually. So what we're going to do is we're going to start with our subtotals. So we're going to right click on the transaction amount expression and we're going to choose add total. So right underneath it, it gives us the sum of the transaction amount. And then we're going to right click on the quantity expression and do the same thing, add total. So we get our sum of quantity. Now we're going to add our daily total. So we're going to right click on the order ID expression, hover over add total. And this time you have a choice before or after. We're going to do after and we're going to set up one more and this is going to be the grand total. We're going to right click on the order date expression, add total and after. So now the total that's in the date column, you're going to click into the cell where it says total and before the word total in that cell, we're going to add the word grand. In the total, in the ID column, before that word total, we're going to add the word daily. And I'm going to expand the ID column a little bit just so daily total doesn't wrap. Now we're going to highlight all the cells in the grand total row. So I'm just clicking on the grand total row header. And we're going to do a little formatting on this row by using the toolbars at the top. 
So what we want to do is we want to give the total row, we'll make it bold and we'll give it a light blue background color. So the double boxes next to the letter A with the dots underneath it, that's your background color. And I'm going to just choose a light blue color and click OK. Let's go ahead and preview our report and see what it looks like. I'm going to go to the last page so I can see my grand totals. I might have to go back one page until it resolves itself. So it looks like our quantity field doesn't need to be as wide as it is because, you know, it's showing more than enough in that grand total. And it looks like we can even minimize the width of our amount field as well. I'm going to go back to page one. And we also want to widen the date column. So we're going to decrease the width on quantity, a little bit on amount. We're going to widen the date column and we could probably decrease the width of the ID column as well. So let's go back to design mode and I'm going to decrease the width on, well, I'm going to widen the date column first, decrease the width on the ID column. I want to keep it so I can see the words daily total. And I'm going to decrease quantity just a little bit, the amount one just a little bit. And then I'll use the extra space for that name column and take a look at that in preview. And I've navigated to the last page just so I can see my grand totals are displaying well. And I'm quite happy with the way it looks right now. So my ID column could be a little bit less wide, but other than that, I'm quite happy with the look of it right now. Let's go back to design view. And this might be a good time to save. So you have on the toolbar, you have save selected items and save all. I usually just do save all. So you want to update it. So since we're creating this from scratch, we're going to have to add a report header text box. So what I'm going to do is I am going to select my table. If I click on an, like the bottom edge of it, it'll get the sizing handles around it and it'll give me the ability to move the table. So I'm going to just move my table down a little bit and I'm going to right click in that blank area above the table, hover over insert and choose text box. And I'm going to move the text box so it's in the upper left hand corner. And I'm going to re resize it so it spans the width of the table. And I'll go ahead and make it just a wee bit taller as well. And in that text box, you're going to type sales information. And then click on the edge of the text box again to make sure it's selected. And we're going to make the font bold and italic. So without selecting the font, if the text box is selected, you can just make those choices and it applies to what's in the text box. We're going to make it 22 point. We're going to center it. And we have that on there. Now we're going to run into a similar situation. Let's preview again. And if you navigate to page two, you'll see that the text box header that we put on sales information is not showing. Neither are the column headings. So just like when we did it through the wizard and the fix is pretty much the same. So we're going to go back to design view and we are going to fix those items. So with the sales information text box selected, Make sure your properties pane is visible. If not, you can go to the view menu and you'll see properties window almost at the bottom to make it show. And it's going to be the same thing. So I'm going to make sure I reselect my text box and in the properties, notice at the top, it says text box 35. It just gave it a default name. I'm going to scroll down to the other section. This is exactly identical to what we did last time in report builder and I'm going to find the repeat with property 
and select the drop down and choose Tablix 1, our table. So repeat that text box with the table. That's step one. Now we have to get the column headings to show. So this is where in our grouping pane, we went to the right of column groups. We did the drop down and chose advanced mode. So this is exactly the same in here as it is in Report Builder. And in the row group section, we clicked on the first static and it selected the date field, the very first column heading rather in our table. And so what we're going to do with that static field is we're going to go over to properties and we're going to navigate down and you'll get to the other category. And in here, we're going to say repeat with, so this is a little bit different and we're going to choose tablets one. So this is the same as what we do with the text box here, right? It's the same process that we're doing in report builder. When it came to the column headings, we selected the first static and then we found the repeat on new page property and set that and it was already set to true. And we had to make sure keep with group was set to after. So here it's slightly different for the header row, but exactly the same as for our report title text box. So when I preview it and I go to the next page, I can see both the text box that we used as a report header is repeating as well as the column headers are repeating. Let's go back to design view and let's select our column header row and just make it bold and then go ahead and save again. So now I know you're probably getting a little annoyed with this particular report since this is the second time we've created it, but bear with me just a little bit longer. You're going to get to do other types of reports. I promise what I'm going to have you do now. I'm going to get you started on this, but we're going to recreate this report again, using the wizard in report designer. So to get started, we're going to right click on the reports folder in solution Explorer. And this time we're going to choose add new report to start the wizard. And if you choose not to have this splash screen come up, you can say, don't show this page again. We're going to do next, right? You're going to be using your shared data source here. So work your way through this wizard to create the same report that we've just done two other times. Just in case you're stuck on this screen of the wizard to design the table, you can look at what I'm using for page group and details here in report designer. On the last page of the wizard, I chose to preview the report. So it took me right into preview mode. And I'll just say one key difference here is that the subtotals when we did it in report builder wizard, it let us choose where the subtotals would be placed. And here we didn't have that choice. So the subtotals are above each item in this type of report that we do in here. So, um, if you'd like, you can go ahead and go to design view and you can spend a few moments and do your column widths and, change the names of your column headings and stuff of that nature. And you want to format your date and your number fields as well. So I've done my formatting and this is my result and good job to you for working your way through that. Again, you can always rewind and look at earlier parts of the video where I was walking you through the formatting, but well done everybody. Go ahead and go back to design view and save. Our last lesson in this module is publishing reports. So when you save a report in report builder, you do have an option to save it locally or to a report server. So we've been saving ours to our report server to SSRS. When you save a report in report designer, it is saved locally. In order to save it to the report server, you must deploy it. Deploy is the SQL server data tools word for publishing. 
You'd also need to deploy any shared data sources and data sets in order to deploy the reports. And we'll be doing that shortly. So you can create, this next section is talking about project configurations when you're deploying. You can create multiple deployment configurations and then use a different one depending on the deployment scenario. Configurations include properties for building reports, such as the folder in which to temporarily store the report and how to handle build issues. They also have properties that you use to specify the location and version of the report server and the folders on the report server. So SSDT provides three project configurations, debug local, debug, and release. Its default configuration is debug local. And we're talking about in Visual Studio now for Report Designer. It's used to view reports in a local preview window. The debug configuration is used to publish reports to like a test server. And the release configuration is used to publish reports to a production server. So I also have on this slide how to edit and create new configurations. There's a link there to the Microsoft Docs topic on that. So I've switched back over to SSRS and I'm on the home screen. I'm gonna go into the SSRS video course folder. And now we can see the paginated report that we created in Report Builder. We're seeing the data set that we created in Report Builder, and we're seeing the data source that we created here in SSRS. What we're not seeing at this point is anything we've created in Visual Studio, and that is because those items are being saved locally, and we have to deploy or publish them, if you will, in order to get them up here in SSRS. So I'm going to switch back over to Visual Studio now. In Visual Studio in Solution Explorer, you want to make sure that you're on the project. So Sales Information VS, the one that's in bold, that can be collapsed, not the one at the top that says Solution Sales Information VS. So once that is selected, right underneath the Solution Explorer title bar, you'll see several icons. There's one that looks like a wrench, and if you hover over it, it will give you properties, and we're gonna do that. This is where you have to set your target server URL. So it defaults to this local host report server or something will be there, but that is not my target server. That's not where my SSRS is. So I'll show you how to find out what your target server is right now. So I've gone into my report server configuration manager and I'm on the web portal URL tab on the left. This URL is the one that we need to put in as our target URL. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that on my screen, put in what I have to put in and you should do the same on yours. So I just typed over what was there. I put in my path, my target server URL, and at the bottom, I'm gonna click away from that and apply and then I'm gonna choose okay. So now that we've set our configuration to release and we made sure we have the right target URL, we're ready to deploy. Now you can deploy the individual items. You can deploy the data source, you can deploy the data sets, you can deploy the reports individually, but there's a far more efficient way of doing this. This is when I'm gonna right click on the line in the Solution Explorer that says Solution Sales Information VS One of One Project. I'm gonna right click and I'm gonna choose Deploy Solution. And you'll get an output window at the bottom of your screen underneath your grouping panel. And the end result of my output is it says it deployed one succeeded, zero failed, zero skipped. Now, Sometimes you'll get a fail with a message, and usually that means that your target server URL has not been set. So I'll save you a lot of research time in trying to overcome how to fix that by setting it before we even attempt it to deploy. So what does this mean now? It means that we've 
essentially published everything in here, the data source, the data set, and the two reports to SSRS. Let's go to SSRS and take a look. I'm going to navigate to the home screen and I'm going to do control R to refresh. And when I do so, I'll see that I have data sources folder here. And when I click on it, it's the shared sales information VS data source. Go back to home. I have the data set that we created in Visual Studio back home. And I have sales information VS folder, which has the two paginated reports that we created in Visual Studio. So we created a folder when we first came in here called SSRS video course. And what I want to do is I want to kind of keep everything in there. Now this is partly my OCD, but it's also how I work. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do the ellipsis in the top of the data sources tile, and I'm going to choose move and I'm going to move it to SSRS video course and select. I'm going to do the same with the data sets folder. And with the sales information VS folder. So now when I go into SSRS video course folder, I have those three other folders in there. So that's everything that's coming in from VS from v visual studio, from report designer, and then everything that's just out here, paginated reports, data sets, and data sources are from within report builder. Just to recap what we covered in module three, we started with lesson one, where we used a report wizard in report builder to create a table report. You learned how to format the values and the dates in the report, how to resize the columns, add a title to the report and all of that kind of stuff and make it repeat the, both the report title and the header row repeat on every page of the report. In lesson two, we created a report, the same report from scratch in report designer via visual studio. And we did the same kind of formatting that we did with the report we created in report builder. Afterwards, I challenged you to use the wizard in report designer to create the report. After that, we talked about publishing a report, which in visual studio is really deploying it. So when we're doing our reports, and our data sets and all of that and report builder, they're automatically up in SSRS. When we do it in Visual Studio through Report Designer, that is not the case. So we had to set our target URL and then we deployed the solution and we took a look at it in SSRS. And we also did some folder cleanup in there, if you will, to get everything in the SSRS video course folder. Thank you for attending the SSRS video course. In conclusion, what did we cover? Well, we started with an introduction to reporting services. You learned about the reporting services components and tools. In the second module, we got into reporting services data sources. So we set up data sources using connection strings appropriate for SQL Server. And then we created data sets and we did these in both Report Builder and Report Designer. We moved on to module three where we started creating paginated reports. We began by using the report wizard in Report Builder. Then we created a report from scratch in Report Designer via Visual Studio. And then you learn that in Report Builder, when you save a report, it's being saved to the report server. In Report Designer, when you save a report, it's being saved locally. In order to get it up to the server, you need to publish it, which is known as deploying it. 
Hi everyone, I'm Trish Connor Cato. Welcome to Analyzing Data with SQL Server Reporting Services, also referred to as SSRS. This video course is for those who will be the administrators of SSRS and who need to create dynamic paginated reports using the reporting tools. You'll also learn the SSRS administrative tasks during the course. When we begin the course, there is a Word document in the video description that I will review with you before we get started into the course. In this Word document, you'll find all the requirements, software requirements necessary to get your system ready for this course, as well as the links and instructions to download and configure software as necessary. In Module 4, you'll focus on how to use filters and parameters to make reports more dynamic and useful to business users. Module 5 introduces you to how to visualize data in SSRS. This includes formatting data, which happens throughout the course, and adding images to reports. You will learn how to create charts, data bars, spark lines, indicators, and gauges. And the module ends by creating a map using spatial data from the database. In Module 4, we'll be working with reporting services data. It's common for business requirements to change regarding the information they need and how they want data presented. On viewing a detailed report, senior management might ask for higher level summarized or filtered versions of the same report. Report Builder and Report Designer support these scenarios. In this module, you'll see how to use filters and parameters to make reports more dynamic and useful to business users. We have three lessons in this module. The first lesson will start talking about data filters. In lesson two, we'll talk about report parameters. In lesson three, we will be implementing report filters and parameters. So let's talk about data filters. There parts of the report that help control what data is in the report after the data is retrieved from the data connection. You would only use filters when you can't change a data set query to filter data before it is retrieved from an external data source. So if it's SQL Server, like you can build in where and or having clauses into your SQL queries, and then the data set would already be filtered when it comes in. So when you reduce the amount of data that must be retrieved and processed, you're also helping to improve the report performance. Now that's not always possible. That's why I'm here to teach you about filtering in reports. So the filter is an equation and it includes a data set field or expression that specifies the data to filter an operator and a value to compare. Only those data values that match the filter condition are included when the item is processed. There's also a link for more information on data set filters from Microsoft Docs. Now the next thing we're gonna talk about are data regions. I refer to them as zones, but they're officially called data regions. It's an object in a paginated report that displays data from a report data set. Data can be displayed as numbers and text in a table, matrix, or list. And we've seen the table already. Graphically in a chart or a gauge and against a geographic background in a map. So you learned a little bit about this, the Tablix data region. So tables, matrices, and lists are all based on that data region. And that expands as needed to display all of the data from the data set. It supports multiple row and column groups, as you've seen, and both static and dynamic rows and columns. You can also save a data region or a map as a report part. Report items such as tables, matrices, charts, and images can be published as report parts. Report parts are paginated report items that have been published separately to a report server, and then they can be reused in other paginated reports. 
So I'm back in Visual Studio and I switched over to our first sales information report, just the sales information VS report. And by the way, you can switch between your two reports from the tabs above them. I'm actually going to go ahead and close the tab for the sales info wizard VS report. And we're going to filter this report. Now our data set spans the range from January 1st, 2013 to May 31st, 2016. And we want to filter the report to only show 2013 sales information. So we're going to select our table and I'm going to right click in a gray area of the table, like in the, any of the gray boxes, the header box, the row boxes, doesn't matter. And then you're going to see Tablix properties. On the left side, we're going to click on filters and we're going to click add. So the expression, we're going to use the drop down arrow to show the fields in our data set. And we're going to select order date for the operator where it says equal it defaults to equals. We're going to do the drop down and we're going to select between the first value box. We're going to just type in, I'm going to just do the simplest date one slash one 2013. I could have done 2013 dash and then zero one dash zero one, but it accepts several different common date formats until it doesn't. And then I'm going to tab over twice because if I tab once, it goes to the function button. So I'm in the second value box and I'm going to type 1231 2013 at the bottom. Click OK. Now we're going to preview this in a moment, but I'm going to go ahead and close my output pane at the bottom from when we deployed this to the report server. And now I'm going to preview. So you can see on page one, it's January 1st, 2013. I'm going to go to the last page and it's December 31st, 2013. Now that's kind of built into the report. Every time the report is run, it's only going to be limited to that date range. We can go back to design view and go ahead and save. So now I'm going to have you on your own do the same filter in report builder on our sales information RB report. I'll show you my completed one in just a bit, but do this one on your own. It's going to be the exact same process as it was in visual studio. It's nice when it's the same exact process in both applications. So you're seeing my last page here, which shows December 31st, 2013. Now what we're going to do is we're going to go and remove the filter. Let's go to design view and we're going to go exactly back where we were, where we created the filter. So I need to go into tablets, properties, filters tab, and you have to click on the expression itself to select the filter. And then the delete button above it will become active. Go ahead and delete the filter and click OK. So we've applied report filters in both visual studio and in report builder. And then you learned how to get rid of a report filter. Whenever those reports that are filtered are run, they're only going to display the items that match the filter condition in order to give your end user more control over what displays you can use report parameters. They enable users to control report data. They can do a lot of things. They can connect related reports together and vary pre report presentation as well. You can use them in paginated reports in both report builder and report designer and in mobile reports that we'll create later in the course through SQL server, mobile report publisher. So there are basically two types of parameters. There are report parameters that serve as filters on reports. All data is loaded into the report and then filtered based on parameters. There are also query parameters, 
which are better for performance as the values of the parameters are sent to SQL Server filtered and then sent to the report. Before we create our parameter in Report Builder, let's go ahead and copy, I'm back in SQL Server Management Studio, and we need to copy that main query again. And then I'm gonna switch over to Report Builder. You'll see why we need that query on our clipboard in a moment. The first thing we need to do here is we need to display the parameters pane. So I'm gonna just right click in a blank area, hover over view and choose parameters. And the parameters pane shows above your report underneath the ribbon interface. In the report data pane, you wanna expand your data sets folder if necessary. And our data set we named sales info. We're gonna right click on sales info. Now I just wanna point something out here. Notice that query is dimmed out. You cannot get to the query from here. And the reason why is because we're using a shared data set. So we would have to go to that original shared data set, modify it in order to do what we need to do. And we don't wanna do that. We wanna use that shared data set for a multitude of reports and for this particular report, we want it to be an embedded data set so that we can modify the query for our parameter. So we're going to go to data set properties. Now, when we get into data set properties, the first thing I'm going to do is rename this data set. I'm going to put the word parameter at the end of it. And then I'm going to do the option button that says use a data set embedded in my report. For your data source, you're going to click the new button in order for it to show you a list of your shared connections. So we can use a shared data source with an embedded data set, and that's what we're going to do. So I'm going to name this data source. I'm just going to call it DSP for data source parameter. And then I'm going to select my shared sales information from my correct report server data source, and we have the ability to test the connection down here. So I'm gonna click test connection, yay. Click okay. If you didn't get a yay, it's probably a credential issue. You'll get an error message. If you look at the details, it will tell you it's probably a credential issue and you could come to your credentials tab and fix it. We're gonna click okay. So we have our shared data source in here. We're gonna to go to the query box and paste our main query. So this is the query that we're gonna modify. It is not our shared, from our shared data set. We're embedding this one in this particular report. And to modify it, we need to add a where clause and the where clause will set up the filter and create the parameter. So the second line from the bottom starts with group by. I'm gonna get in front of group by and press enter and do my up arrow to get into that blank line. And I'm gonna type where. Now we have to refer to the field the way it's referred to in this query. And so in this query, all of the tables from the database have been assigned aliases. The order date field is in a table called sales orders, which has an alias SO. So if you look down in the group by clause, you'll see group by SO dot order ID comma SO dot order date. We're gonna type SO dot order date. And then we're gonna do a space and a greater than equal sign. And then we're gonna do an at symbol or a mention symbol as they're getting known nowadays. And we're gonna type, so the at symbol says, make this a parameter. And we're gonna name the parameter order date. So that line should say where so dot order date greater than equal at order date. At the bottom, we're gonna click okay. Now, a couple of things have happened. Your parameters pane is now populated with the order date parameter. And if you look in the report data pane, the parameters folder 
has the order date parameter. And just make note of the icon. You can see the little at symbol in the bottom right corner of that icon for a parameter in Report Builder. So what does this do? It's gonna give the end user the ability to select the start date of the report. So our data goes from January 1st, 2013 through May 31st, 2016. And if the user would like to start the report, say like in January of 2015, they will be able to do that. So now we're gonna change some parameter properties before we test our parameter. So in the parameters pane, you're gonna double click on order date and it opens the parameter properties window. So you see the name and then it has a prompt. We're gonna click in front of order date in the prompt text box and we're gonna type select a start date for report. Actually, we can just get rid of order date out of there too. I was gonna have it say something different, but I changed my mind. The next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna change the data type from text to date time. When it's the date time data type on a parameter, it gives the end user the ability to use a little mini calendar instead of typing in the date. And we're gonna click okay at the bottom. So now let's go ahead and run our report. And we're gonna type in January 1st, 2015. And you can either press enter or go all the way to the right and click the view report button. And notice the report starts with January 1st, 2015. We can go back to design view and let's save this report. In the next module, we're gonna be working with parameters a bit more, creating multiple parameters on a report and so on and so forth. But for right now, we wanna recreate this parameter in Visual Studio. So I'm gonna switch over to Visual Studio. Now this way, you'll see there are slight differences in how you handle this in Visual Studio versus Report Builder. Uh, so we're gonna start by right-clicking anywhere on our interface hovering over view and grabbing the parameters pane. And then we're gonna go over to the report data pane and right click on our data set. And again, this is a shared data set. So we can't get to the query. We're gonna go to data set properties. So, so far everything has been the same. We're gonna do use a data set embedded in my report. We're gonna select that option button. And at the end of the name of this data set, we're gonna just put the word param or abbreviation param for parameter. For the data source here, we're gonna to go to new. Now, this is where it's slightly different. Okay, this screen. When we go to new in Report Builder, it brings us to our shared data sources. Here, it defaults to an embedded connection as if we wanted to create an embedded data source just in this report, and we'd have to build the connection string and everything. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna first go down to the option button for use shared data source reference. And then here, we're gonna do the drop down, and our shared data source will show. In Report Builder, we had to click New to see that. So just slight differences here. We're gonna name this one, we can just name it parameter. And we're gonna click okay at the bottom. Oh, I already have something named parameter. So I'm gonna just call it parameter, parameters, plural, and do okay. Now we're gonna paste our query in. Again, our main query, it should still be on your clipboard. And above the group by statement, we're gonna put in our where clause, where so dot order date. And then we have our greater than equal symbols and then at symbol order date. Same as we did in report builders query. And we're gonna click okay. So now we have that. So. This is an instance where I'd like you to see the error happen, 
because it's a pretty common error, especially when you're new to doing this. So before we get to the error, let's double click on order date in the parameters pane. And we're going to change the prompt to enter a start date. And we're going to make it a date time data type. So it gives the little mini calendar and we'll click OK. If you notice in your parameters folder in the report data pane, the icon is slightly different than in report builder, but it still has that at symbol on it. So this is where the error is going to happen. Let's go ahead and preview. And let's put in January 1st, 2014 and press enter. And we're going to get a blank report. This is the reason why let's go back to design view and we're going to select our table. We're going to right click in a gray area and go to Tablix properties. We never remove the filter in here. We had removed the filter in report builder. So we have to remove the filter here. So we're going to go to filters. We're going to click in the expression and then delete. Okay. Out of there and now go and preview. And this time we'll put in January 1st, 2014, press enter. And now it's going to load the results. So you can see that the start date of the report is January 1st, 2014. We're going to go back to design view. So the parameter will not work if you have a filter applied on the Tablix region. So just to recap what we did in module four, working with reporting services data, we started with data filters and you learned how to apply data filters via Tablix properties. We also learned how to delete data filters. And then we moved on to creating report parameters by making embedded data sets and adding a where clause to the main query copy. And we then formatted the parameter via its properties to select a prompt and a data type. And we implemented the report filters and parameters. We did this both in report builder and report designer and in report designer in visual studio, we encountered an error with our parameter because we hadn't deleted the report filter. As the amount of data being generated continues to grow, the need to make sense of its meaning increases. You use data visualization to make data easier to understand and faster to interpret. Data visualizations highlight comparisons, show trends, and convey scale much faster than a table of numbers could. The detail is important, but visualizations are a highly effective way of conveying meaning and insights quickly and accurately. And we'll be focusing on that in module five. So we have been formatting data along the way during this course and lesson one is targeting toward formatting data. And we will be doing some more data formatting in this module. Lesson two will take us into images and charts as visualization tools. And lesson three, you'll learn other visualization tools, including data bars, spark lines, indicators, gauges, and maps. We're going to start this module in SSRS. In your files for the, in the video description, there is a PNG file called Learn It Logo. We're going to be using that logo in this module. And in order to access it, we're going to have to upload it to SSRS. So if you haven't already grabbed all the files from the video description, you want to go and get that Learn It logo. And in SSRS, we're going to use the upload button and navigate to wherever you saved that logo. Let me get to where I saved it. And I'm going to just double click it. And it lets me know that the upload is complete. 
So it creates a category called resources. We have one resource and it is that Learn It logo. So now we're gonna switch over to Visual Studio. We're gonna start by creating a new report from scratch in here. So in Solution Explorer, I'm gonna right click on the reports folder. I'm gonna choose add and then choose new item. And we're gonna name this report sales by quarter. And we're gonna click on add. So we have our framework for the report. Well, we'll leave the parameters pane open because we're gonna be doing more parameters in this module. But let's right click on your report surface. We're gonna do insert. And this time we're gonna choose chart. In your select chart type dialog box, notice the types of charts on the left side and there's not any called pie. In here, they're called shape charts. So I'm gonna go to the first shape, which is when you hover over it, it says pie. The second one says exploded pie, but as a category, it's known as shape. So I want the first shape and I'm gonna click okay. So now it brings me up to the data set properties. We're gonna name the data set quarterly chart. And we're gonna use a data set embedded in our report. We're gonna click the new button to the right of data source. We're gonna name this data source chart data, and we're gonna choose our shared data source reference. And using the drop down, we're gonna select shared sales information VS. And we're gonna go ahead and click okay. And then click in the query. Now it's probably the main query has um, script in there that breaks things down by quarter and we can use that main query. It should still be on your clipboard, so I'm gonna just paste it in here. And by the way, when we were doing our parameters in the last module, what we're doing in here is not impacting the queries that we have in SQL Server Management Studio at all. That's why we're doing it this way. If we wanted to impact that, we'd have to start all over again with our shared data set, which does not include that where clause. For right now, we're gonna just do okay. We'll come back in later and do our parameters. So we get the framework of this pie chart and I'm gonna just move it to the upper left corner and expand its size to fit that framework of the report. Now we're gonna configure our chart. So let's start by clicking directly on the pie chart and when you do so, the chart data pane, pane opens to the right of your chart. And we can do this a couple of different ways. One way I like to do it is just by using the chart data pane instead of opening my data set and dragging and dropping fields. I'm gonna do the plus sign to the right of values and I'm gonna choose transaction amount. So it automatically puts it in the values box and it shows the sum of the transaction amount. Now, if you wanted to use a different aggregate, you can click the drop down arrow to the right of sum, hover over aggregate, and then change to a different aggregate. We're gonna leave it on the sum. We're gonna do the plus sign to the right of category groups, and we're gonna choose quarter. And then we're gonna add a chart title that's quarterly sales. So above your pie, you'll see the chart title text box and you're gonna just type quarterly. Oh, I forget in this one, you actually have to delete the placeholder text. Some programs you don't have to delete it before you can type. So I've got my chart title in. Let's go ahead and preview this chart right now.
So you notice when you're previewing it, the legend shows the different quarters by color, right? And okay, so far so good. Let's go back to design view. It cracks me up that when you're in design view, the legend shows six quarters. What we're going to do is we want to show some data labels on the chart. So if you right click on your chart, you can click on show data labels. So now it'll have the value of each slice of the pie that actually shows on the chart. And we're going to do a couple of other formatting issues here too. We would like a solid line between each pie slice to kind of make them look a little bit more highlighted. So we're going to right click on the chart again. And this time we're going to go to series properties. On the left side, we're going to click on border. And for the line style, it defaults. There's a default in there. We're going to do the drop down and we're going to choose solid. So it defaults to no line. And we're going to change the width of the line to two points. And we're going to change the line color to white. And you can see it on your little preview. Now we have a two point white solid line between each slice of pie. And we're going to click OK. Let's take a look in preview. So the data labels look a little messy here. Let's go back to design view. And we're going to right click on a data label. And we're going to choose series label properties. We're going to go to the font tab on the left. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to change the font color to white. And I'm going to make it smaller. I'm going to make it like eight point. And then I'm going to go to the number tab and I'm going to change it from default to number and get rid of the decimal places. So zero decimal places and click OK. When we created this chart, it gave it a default name of chart one. So I want to make sure nothing is selected. I just want to be clicking a white area of the chart framework. So nothing in it is selected. And then on your properties pane on the right side, in the general category, we're going to change the name from chart one to quarterly sales. That helps if you're going to have multiple charts in reports to name them. So you don't have chart one, chart two, chart three, so on and so forth. If you want to change the color of your pie slices on your chart, select your chart. And that's something that we can do in the properties pane. So in the appearance section, we're looking for the color property and it defaults to automatic. To the right of automatic, there's a drop down. When you select the drop down, you're going to select the link that says more colors. And then there's like 16 palettes that they have in here that you can choose from. So you can look through the list of palettes. You can choose one that you like. I'm going to look for one called earth tones and choose that one for my pie chart. So I noticed my earth tones palette is no longer here. They update somehow. I'm not seeing it or it's no longer here. I know that sometimes they're there. Sometimes they're not. They switch them out or change the name. So I'm going to just choose a different one for myself. I'm going to go with one called Peru and click OK. So now if I go and preview my chart, all the pie slices have the same color. So I'm going to go back to design and I'm going to kind of undo that. I'm going to just go back to the color, my now Peru drop down, go back to more colors. And I'm going to just go back and change it back to the automatic palette 
because that one gave us the different color ones. And let's preview our chart again. And so our data labels look a little bit better. We made them white. You can see our lines that we put between the chart. And our legend, we decide that mm, we want to make the font in the legend a little bit different. So let's go back to design. And we're going to do a few things here. Select your legend. And I want to right click on it. So I want to right click on the legend and go to legend properties. And on the left side, let's go to font and let's make the font bold in the legend by checking the bold checkbox and clicking OK. And now we're going to create two parameters for this chart. So our parameter pane is already showing. We're going to expand our data sets folder in the report data pane right click on our quarterly chart data set. And because this is an embedded data set, we have a choice. We could go to query or we could go to data set properties. Let's go to query this time. So now you see it shows, we have all of these things that are showing in here, right? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna hide some of these things. We're actually interested in just the query itself. So we have the ability by using these buttons on the toolbar to hide the top pane is known as the diagram pane. So I'm going to click the drop down on this show hide diagram pane and hide it. The next one over from that is showing and hiding the grid pane. I'm going to hide that. So it just leaves me with my query here. And then I'm going to choose the edit as text button. And I'm going to drag the divider bar down so I can see more of the query. And so we can see it looks different in here, but we can see our group by clause. We're going to click in front of group, press enter, and do an up arrow. And we're going to type where. We're going to create two parameters in the same where statement. We're going to type where. And the first one is going to be the same one we've done before. So dot order date. And what we're going to put here instead of greater than or equal, we're going to do between. And we're going to create two parameters. The first parameter, we're going to call it start date. And the second one, we're going to call end date. So we're going to do our at symbol and type start date. And then we're going to do the and keyword at symbol and type end date. So where so dot order date between at start date and at end date. And now we're going to click OK on the bottom. So we'll see our start date and end date parameters in the parameters pane, as well as in the parameters folder. And we want to format both of them to the date time format. And we'll change the prompt a little bit as well. So double click start date in the parameters pane. We're going to say enter start date for our prompt and change it to date time. So in addition to giving you the little mini calendar, when you use the date time data type, it also allows for more international date formats to be utilized. And we're going to click OK. We're going to double click end date. The prompt is going to be enter and end date. Change it to date time and OK. Let's preview this. And we'll use January 1st, 2015. And for an end date, we'll put December 31st, 2015. And so it's showing that information now in the chart. The numbers are different than they were before. Now, this leads me to the next thing that we're going to do. 
which is we can display a text box on our report saying what it's covering, the range of dates that it's covering. Let's go back to design view. And at this point, let's save. So we're gonna add a report header to this report by right clicking, actually it's called a page header, and adding a page header. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna go up to the parameters pane or you could do it from the parameters folder. I'm gonna drag the start date parameter into the page header and it puts it in a text box up there. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna move that text box over to the left and I'm gonna expand the width of it. And now, so it puts that parameter in and notice the format that it's using. It's a open square bracket and then the at start date close square bracket. Before that opening square bracket, so get into that text box and I wanna get before that square bracket and I'm gonna type order dates between and a space, click after the closing square bracket, type the and word, and then make a space, and then drag your end date parameter down to that part. So it will take whatever dates the end user chooses for their parameters and put them in the report itself by doing it that way. Let's test it. Let's go to preview. And we can choose, I'll do 2013 this time just for variety sakes. January 1st through 1231. So now you'll see that it has order dates between January 1st, 2013. It puts the date and time there and 1231, 2013 on the report. Now, why would that be necessary if someone can just look up here and see the dates. It's necessary if you're planning to export this to another format. So that save icon on the report toolbar is your vehicle to export. So if I go to save and I export it, you're not gonna see the parameters pane in your export. So having the text box there in the page header would help if I exported this to Word or Excel or PowerPoint or any of those other formats. So, and that's the same as in Report Builder as it is in here. So yeah, if you're going to be exporting it, this is a good idea to let the people that are viewing it know what date range is being encompassed. And we're gonna go back to Design View and Save. We're gonna fix that placeholder text in the page header so it doesn't show the date and time. And it's easy to do. We're gonna right click on the start date parameter placeholder and we're gonna go to placeholder properties. On the left side, we're gonna go to number, we're gonna select date, and we're gonna find the date that says January 31st, 2000. And we're gonna do the same thing for the end date placeholder. And click okay. And now let's go and preview that. So you can put in whatever date range you want from January 1st, 2013, all the way through May 31st, 2016, if you want the whole data set, but I'm just doing the year of 2013 here. So now it's clearer in the placeholder and we don't have the time piece of the date involved. And we can go back to design view. Now we're gonna put an actionable text box underneath our chart. And when the text in the text box is clicked, it will actually go to a specific URL. So the first thing we're gonna do is put your mouse on the bottom black border underneath your chart so you get that vertical arrow. Hold your mouse down and drag down just a little bit. 
In the newly created blank space, you're going to right click, hover over insert, and you're going to choose text box. We're going to move the text box to the left side and expand its width. And in it, we're going to type for additional information on chart formats, comma, click here, period. Now we're going to click away from the text box and then right click on it to select it. And we're going to go to text box properties. On the left side, we're going to select action. And the action we're going to choose is go to URL. Click in your select URL box. Now, I have a URL that we're going to use in that software requirements Word document. So I'm going to bring that up. And almost at the bottom, you have a URL for a chart. So we can't copy it from the Word document into report designer. We're going to actually hold down your control key and click on the URL in the word document to actually go to that URL. And then we're going to go up to the address bar and select the URL and copy it from there. Now we can go back to visual studio. And we can paste it into that select URL box and we can okay. So now let's preview this report. I'm going to use January 1st, 2013 through December 31st, 2013. You can use whatever date range you like here. And now when I hover over that text for additional information on chart formats, click here, it will actually bring up that website and we can close both of those website tabs. I'm going to leave my SSRS open, but close both of those website tabs and go ahead and save. Earlier, we uploaded the Learn It logo to SSRS. It has to be in SSRS in order for us to access it from within Report Builder. But we're in Report Designer now, so we're going to access it a totally different way. We're going to right click in the blank area under that order dates between, and now we have our parameter placeholders. We're going to right click in that blank space and choose Insert. Notice because we're within the body of the report, we don't have a long list of things that we can insert. We're going to choose image and it opens the image properties dialog box. We're going to name the image, learn it logo, and we'll give it a tool tip. Please visit learnit.com for all your training needs. Exclamation point, just because the image source in here is going to be embedded and we're going to choose import. So it opens up the folder where our project is saved and we need to get the logo into that folder. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just go to my window explorer window and bring up my files for the video description. I'm going to copy learn it logo. And then I'm going to just paste it into that directory in the open dialog box. Now it's not showing. Why isn't it showing in the lower right corner above the open button? It's only looking at JPEG files. We need to do the drop down and select PNG files, and then you'll see your learn it logo. You can double click it and now it has it in here and we're going to click. Okay. So we're going to move that logo over to the right, and then we're going to expand its width so we can actually see the entire logo. So it looks like that and go ahead and preview, select whatever date range you want.
we're going to take a moment to reorganize our parameters pane. So it has four columns and two rows. It starts out that way and we don't need four columns. We just need one. And so what we're going to do is I'm going to just click and hold on the enter and end date parameter and just drag it and drop it underneath enter start date. And then I'm going to right click on the empty column to the right and delete the column. And these columns, I haven't figured out a way to select more than one to delete at the same time. So we're going to delete the other two columns that are empty at this point as well. And that's not a necessary step. I've mentioned my OCD, so I kind of like a clean workspace whenever possible, but you should be able to know that you're able to do that. And it will create more grids for you. If you add more parameters, we are going to save this report and we can close it. I'm going to use the tab to close it. And we should still have our sales info VS report open. And let's get rid of, well, actually we'll leave the parameters pane the way it is because we want to add two more parameters to this at this point. So now we're going to right click on our data set and because we made it embedded, we can go directly to query or data set properties. I actually prefer data set properties. And we're going to modify our where clause in this query here. So right now we just have the order date. We only have one parameter. We have it order date is what we called it. And so what we're going to do is we're going to click at the end at that where statement. And actually we're going to change the greater than equal sign to the keyword between. And then in here, let's call it start date. So we're going to call that, we're going to rename that parameter from at order date to at start date, click at the end of it and type the and keyword and then at end date. But we have more, we're going to press enter. And we're going to type and, and then WSI is a table alias dot. And the field name is stock item name. Because it's a text field, we can't use like an equal or something like that. It's going to be the like keyword. So, and WSI dot stock item name like, and we're going to do a parameter. So at, and we're going to name it item name. And now we're going to click okay. So we have start date, end date, and item name. We're going to get rid of the enter a start date parameter that we had there before. Right? So that one was based off. It's really the order date one and we made one called start date and end date now. So in the parameters folder, I'm going to right click on order date and delete and confirm the deletion. And then I'm going to drag the start date to the first column. I'm going to drag end date underneath start date. And then I'm going to drag item name underneath. And now we're going to double click item name. And for the prompt, we're going to put in enter item name. And then at the end of that line in parentheses, we're going to type the percent symbol as wildcard and close the parentheses. So this is saying to the end user, you can enter a partial item name by using the percent sign. So we're going to go ahead and click OK. And let's save this. And then go into preview. And you'll see your three parameters there. So I'm going to just use January 1st, 2014 this time and December 31st, 2014 as my start and end dates. 
And then for the item name, I'm going to type USB and a percent. And I'm going to look at my report. So it's just showing me the date range is fine. I keep getting these errors that pop up, but they don't mean anything. The date range is fine, right? And it's showing me any item name that contains USB. So USB followed by anything else. Now, imagine if we had an item where USB was in the middle of the item name. We would have to put the percent in front of USB as well as the percent behind it. So it will find USB wherever it is. Since we put the percent afterwards, it's only finding those that are starting with USB. And you can go back to design view. You would really want to make your reports as easy to use, especially your parameters in your reports, as easy to use for the end users as possible. So instead of relying on them to have to know the wild cards, the percents, and how they need to be placed, we're going to create an expression that concatenates the wild cards so they won't ever have to use them. And so we're going to head back to our data set and right click on it and go back to data set property. The change we're going to be making is going to be in the line that starts with and wsi.stockitemName like at item name. That's where we're going to be making this change to concatenate the percent signs in. So after the like keyword, I'm going to use a space, we're going to do a single quote, the percent sign, close the single quote. Then we're going to do a space and a plus sign. Click at the end of the line after the parameter at item name. You're going to do a space, another plus sign, single quote, percent, single quote. So this is saying it's adding the percent before the item name. The plus sign is the concatenation character here, right? And it's adding a percent after the item name. So wherever USB shows up, in the item name, the end user won't be responsible for using the percentages. We're going to go ahead and click OK. And let's change this. Let's um, change the prompt for this one. So I'm going to double click enter item name percent as wildcard. And in parentheses, I'm going to get rid of that percent as wildcard and I'm going to type partial names accepted and click OK. Let's preview it again. Use whatever date range you want. And we're going to use USB again, but we don't have to type any percentages. Just type USB, and it's not case sensitive. So now we have our results. The end user does not have to know about the wild cards and how to use them. Let's go back to design view. If an end user puts incorrect information in the parameters and the result is no results when they preview the report, it would be good to have a message for them that lets them know that there are no results so they don't think that they did something wrong. And we're going to set that up now. Before we do that, we're going to modify our item name parameter. So let's double click it. And under the data type, we're going to allow blank value. And we're going to change what's in the parentheses. So after partial names accepted, I'm going to do a dash and type, or you can leave blank. So we're giving the end user the ability to not have to put in an item name, partial or otherwise. And let's go ahead and click OK. Now we're going to go to preview. Show you what happens here. Let's put in a start date of January 1st, 2023. I don't know when you're watching this video, but we want to pick dates in the future. And I'll do it through 1231 
2023 and I'll press enter. So I get no results. I don't know why, blah, blah, blah. We're going to have a message that displays concerning the date range in our database. So let's go back to design view. What we're going to do is we're going to select our table and let me just make sure nothing in there in particular is selected. So if I look at my properties panel on the right, it lets me know that I'm in Tablix one. That's the table. Scroll down in the properties panel until you see the no rows group. And there is a no rows message property. We're going to click in that text box and we're going to go to its drop down and select expression. So we're going to create a concatenated expression here, letting the end user have some information if they get no results. After the equal sign, I'm going to do a space and then I'm going to do a double quote and I'm going to type no results found for the start date space closing double quote space. We're using the ampersand as the concatenation character here. The rest of this, we can get in a little bit easier under your categories, double click parameters. And over on the right, you'll see the three parameters that we have start date, end date, and item name. So you're going to just double click start date and it puts in parameters, exclamation point, start date dot value, which is nice that you don't have to type it. We're going to do a space, another ampersand, a space, double quote, a space after the double quote, and we're going to type the end date. and close our double quote. And actually before the end date, before the, we're going to type the word and, and the end date. And then at the end of that, and there is a little scroll bar here, we have our closing double quote, but we need a space before the closing double quote. After that double quote, we're going to do another ampersand. And this time we're going to double click the end date from the value box or end date parameter from the value box space ampersand space double quote space you have selected period two spaces, the date range of our database is one one twenty thirteen dash five thirty one twenty sixteen period close double quote. So I'll read it out to you again and scroll across equal after the equal sign. We have a space open double quote, no results found for the start date space closing double quote space ampersand parameters, exclamation point, start date dot value space ampersand space, double quote space and the end date space, double quote space ampersand parameters, exclamation point, end date dot value space ampersand space, double quote space you have selected period. Space space. The date range of our database is 11 2013 dash 531 2016 period closing double quote. Let's go ahead and click OK. And we want that message to show up in red font. So right underneath no rows, we have our color. We're going to click on the black color, go to the drop down and choose red. Okay. So now we're ready to preview this and we're going to put in January 1st, 2023. 
December 31st, 2023, press enter. So we get that no results found for the start date and it gives us our parameter start date and the end date you have selected the date range of our database is. So that way they will know and maybe be able to correct their error. Maybe it was just an innocent typo or they're just waiting for next year. We can go back to design view and we can save. So our final lesson in this module is about data bars, spark lines, indicators, gauges, and maps. Data bars typically represent a single data point. They can represent multiples. They don't have legends, axis lines, labels, or tick marks. Each spark line typically presents a single series. They also are legendless. Indicators are small gauges that convey the state of a single data value at a glance. They're most commonly used in tables and matrices to visualize data in rows or columns. A gauge data region displays a single value from your data set. An individual gauge can be positioned inside a gauge panel where you can add child or adjacent gauges. And then we have maps, which are maps. So we're going to go ahead and get started on this in Visual Studio. Now we're going to insert a data bar that represents the quantity for each of our line items. So we're going to select our table and then right click on the gray bar, the table column heading for quantity. You're going to select insert column and then write. In the blank column in the second row, you're going to right click, go all the way to the bottom and choose insert and you're going to choose data bar from the list. We're going to go with the default data bar that's selected here and click OK. So now what we need to do is we need to click on our data bar so we get that chart data window that opens. And we're going to do the plus sign for values. Before we do this actually, let me show you what happens if we don't do it. So let's just go and preview. And let's put in January of 2016 as our date range and run the report. So nothing is populated because we have to attach to the data bar the field that it's going to represent. So you don't know how many times I've done this and actually forgotten that step. And then I get here and I see the blank and I'm like, really, Trish, you should know better. So we're going to go back to design view. We're going to select the data bar so the chart data opens, do the plus sign for values and choose quantity. Now, this is another little tricky wicket. If we click away from it and then right click on the data bar, you'll get this context menu or shortcut menu. I'm going to click away from that. I'm going to select the data bar again so that chart data is open. And if I right click on the data bar now, I get a totally different menu. And what we want to put here is show data labels. So now let's preview this. And you can use any dates that you'd like. And so we can see the value is the same as the value in the quantity column for each data bar. Their width will vary depending on the value. So the wider the data bar, the higher the value, so on and so forth. Because we're going to show the data labels for our data bars, we don't need the quantity column anymore. So we're going to go back to design. We're going to delete that quantity column. And we're going to give our data bar column the heading of QTY. We're going to format our data bar just a little bit. So we're going to select the data bar. And in the properties pane, we will be able to change the color of the data bar. So we're going to use it. We're going to change the color of the data bar by changing its palette. So you'll notice there's a property, it's under chart, right? 
and it's a palette property. It's bright pastel right now. We're going to click where it says bright pastel, do the drop down arrow. There's my earth tones palette. I knew it wasn't in the other screen, but here it is. I'm going to just choose earth tones. I'm so happy to see that again. And then we're going to select the data label for our data bar. And we're going to format it as bold from the toolbar. And now let's go and preview this. And so we have the graphical representation of the quantity as well as the data label showing the actual number of the quantity. And we can go back to design view and save. So now we're going to enter a spark line, which will represent the daily total. So that's this non bolded total row is what we want it to represent. And it's going to be the daily sum of the transaction amount. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to right click on the amount column header and we're going to insert a column to the right. Now with this one, it's a little tricky. Just watch. I'm going to do this because it won't work. And this is something that you kind of need to know. I like to kind of point out the possible errors. If I go to the second row and I right click and I do insert spark line, I'm going to get an error message. Cannot insert a multi-value item into a detail cell. I'm going to click OK. We're doing it for the daily total. So I have to be in that row, the row above the last row. And this is what you, where you can join in and do this as well. We're going to right click, insert, and then we're going to choose spark line. On the left side of the select spark line type dialog box, we're going to click on line and we'll go with the first line spark line and click OK. Just like a data bar, we have to tie it to the field. So we're going to click on it. We're going to do the plus sign for values in chart data, and we're going to choose transaction amount. So the spark line is going to represent the sum of the transaction amount for a particular day, for every particular day. And we can go to the preview and check it out. And you can use whatever date range you want. And so you may say, what? We're not seeing anything here. Well, let's go to the next page. And next page again, I want to get to January 2nd. Okay, so I'm on page five. And now I can see my spark line showing the total for that date. And so it's the sum of the transaction amounts for that particular date. Let's go back to design view. And we want to widen that column that has the spark line in it. And after widening the column, we can go back and preview it again. And I'm just going to type in page five and press enter there. So I can see it a little bit more clearly now. So it's taking all of the transaction amounts and showing them for that one date in the form of a spark line. And we're back to design view and save. I've switched over to report builder to our sales information report, sales info RB report. And we're going to use this report to insert an indicator. So we're going to do an indicator for transaction amount. And we're going to put the indicator in a new column to the right of transaction amount. This is the same process in both applications. So I'm going to just select my table, right click on the amount column header, insert column to the right. Now this has to be in a detail cell. So I'm going to go to the second cell, right click, hover over insert, 
and I am going to choose indicator. And so under directional indicators, we want the one when you hover over it, it says four arrows colored. That's the indicator that we're going to use. So once you select it, go ahead and click OK. Now we have to assign a field to the indicator. So we're going to click on it and the gauge data box opens to the right where it says unspecified due to drop down and choose transaction amount. And it defaults to sum. And if you wanted to change that, you could, but we're good with sum. Now let us run this and see what we have. So I'm going to just give it a start date. And so we can clearly see our indicators, except they're all exactly the same. They're all the red downward pointing arrow. So we have to do a little bit more work for it to actually show the actual amounts. So we're going to go back to design view. In design view, we're going to right click on our indicator and we're going to go down to indicator properties. On the left side, we're going to select value and states. And now if you look at the bottom of the screen, we have to tell it, we're going to tell it what values to use. It has some default values in there, zero to 25 for the down arrow, so on and so forth. It also defaults to a percentage. So where it says states measurement unit, we're going to do the drop down and we're going to select numeric. And now the bottom half updates, but we have to give it the right values based on the data that we have in our database. So the first color, the downward pointing red arrow, the start, we're going to leave it at zero, but it's end, we're going to put in 5,000. The next arrow down, it's going to be 5,001 as it start and it's going to go to 10,000. The next one is going to be 10,001 and it's going to end at 15,000. And our last one is going to be 15,001 and we're going to give it an enormous number to end it. We're going to do 5 billion, so 5 with 9 zeros. And then at the bottom, we're going to click OK. So now if we go and run our report here and give it a start date, we'll see that we have the different arrows depending on the value that's represented. And we can go back to design view and go ahead and save your report. Since we use a data bar to represent the quantity in Visual Studio, we're going to use a gauge to represent the quantity here in Report Builder. So we're going to insert a new column to the right of the existing quantity column. We're going to right click in the second cell, go to insert, and we're going to choose gauge. We're going to select the last linear gauge. It's called bullet graph, and I'm going to just double click it. Once it's in, I'm going to select it so I get the gauge data, and we're going to assign quantity to both linear pointer one and linear pointer two. And, you know, as usual, it defaults to the sum of quantity, which is fine. Okay, so I have quantity assigned to linear pointer one and linear pointer two. With the gauge data panel still open, I'm going to right click on my gauge and I'm going to go to scale properties. We're going to set a maximum that relates to the data in our database. So we're going to choose maximum here and we're going to change it to 400. The highest one in our data set is like 360 or something. So I'm going a little bit over that. 
And then on the left side, I'm going to click on the number tab and I'm going to choose default and click OK. We're going to give it a column heading of Q, T, Y, gauge. And then let's go ahead and run the report. So now we can see the little mini gauges that are graphically representing the quantities. These are all different things that you can use for visualizing your data. We can go back to design view and save. So now we're going to create a map report and we're going to use the map wizard here in report builder. But before we get started, we're going to finally be using a different query. So let's switch over to SQL Server Management Studio. And in here, you can go to your drop down over in the upper right corner if necessary to see all of your queries. And we want the map query. So this particular query has geospatial data in it. Meaning this delivery location is coded. It includes a bunch of things, including longitude and latitude. And also you'll notice that there's an extra tab on the bottom to the right of results that says spatial results. So it's kind of plotting different locations here based on a delivery location. So we're going to go ahead and click up in the query text and do control AC to copy it. And then we can switch back over to report builder. We want to make sure this report is saved. And then we're going to go to the file tab and we're going to click on new. So we're going to choose the map wizard and we need to choose a source of spatial data. So we're going to use SQL server spatial query. And once we select that option button, we're going to do next. Now we're going to be using a new data set. So we're not using our shared data set. We're going to go to the bottom and we're going to select the option button for add a new data set with SQL server spatial data and next. So we can use our same shared data source. Cause again, the data source is a connection to the entire wide world importers database. So I'm going to select my shared sales information from my training report server. I'm going to choose test connection, click OK, and choose next. So now we're going to put in our query. We're going to choose the edit as text button at the top, and we're going to paste our map query into that box. And by the way, with this map query, what I've done is I limited the results. So I use the offset and the fetch features. So offset zero rows means start at the first row of data, but only bring in the first 500 rows, just so the map is not overwhelmed with all the data that we have in our database. And after we have that query in there, we're going to choose next. We're going to leave delivery location as our spatial field with layer type. We're going to leave it on point. That's the only one that's supported by a Bing maps layer. We want to check the box underneath that says embed map data into this report. And we're going to check the box that says add a Bing maps layer. And you'll notice the little preview changes. Now the tile type defaults to road there for your Bing map layer. And we're going to do the drop down next to road. You can look at aerial if you'd like. So it's showing the overhead view of these delivery locations. And then the other one in the drop down, which we're going to select and keep is hybrid. So it's kind of like aerial and road mixed together. And if you will. And now we're going to choose next. We're going to choose the bubble map and next. And now we have to use our 
data set that we put in here, it's called data set one. We didn't name it anything. It says it's in this report. So we have that selected. And we're going to choose next. So the match fields is creating a relationship between spatial and analytical data. The database has already kind of done that before we even restored it in SQL Server Management Studio. So we don't have to do anything on this screen except click next. And on this screen, choose color theme and data visualization. We have to give it a data field. We're going to use bubble sizes to visualize data and we have to give it a data field. So we're going to do the drop down and select transaction amount from that list. And now we're going to click finish at the bottom. It switched me back over to SSMS. So I just came back over here and we can see that we have our map framework here in design view. Let's save this. And I'm going to put it in the SSRS video course folder and I'm going to call this one, we'll just call it map, sales map. Let's do that. Sales map. Oops, I don't want spaces there. And save. Let's go ahead and run this report. So you can see the map and you can see the bubble size represents different transaction amounts. The smaller the bubble, the lesser amount. And we're going to do some fixes to this report. So let's go back to design view. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to add some parameters. So go ahead and expand your data sets folder in the report data pane, right click on data set one and go to data set properties. And here we can actually name this data set just for our purposes. We're going to just call it map data. We're going to add a where clause before the order by clause. So I'm going to click in front of order by enter and up arrow. So where clauses always go before the order by clause. So we're going to type where and the field is S C T Sam Charlie Tango dot and transaction amount is the name of the field. And then we're going to type between, we're going to do the at symbol and type min a M T for amount space and at symbol max a M T for amount. So two parameters, min amount, and max amount. And we're going to click OK. So we should see our parameters up in the parameters pane as well. If you expand the parameters folder as usual. And we need to change the properties for both of those parameters. So I'm going to go and click on min amount. We want to make the data type an integer here. And the prompt is going to be enter the minimum transaction amount and click OK. And then we're going to do the same for max amount, except it's going to be enter the maximum transaction amount. Make sure you change it to an integer as well. And go ahead and OK that one. Save your report again. Now we're going to adjust the legend. If you look at the legend, you can barely see it. The font is in white and it's kind of transparent. So you really, it's not standing out too much when you're looking at it. So we want to right click on that legend and we want to go to legend properties. We want to kind of move the legend out of the map. 
So on the first tab, the general tab at the bottom, there's a checkbox that says show legend outside the viewport. The viewport is what the map is contained in. So we're going to check that box. And then on the left side, we're going to go to the font tab and we're going to make the legend bold, the font and the legend bold, and we're going to make it 10 point. And then we're going to go to the fill tab on the left and we're going to change the fill color of the legend. So I'm going to go to the color drop down, and I'm going to select like a really the darkest green color that I can choose there. And now click OK. So the legend displays a lot better when it's outside of the viewport. We gave it a contrasting dark color, white bold font. And we're going to change the title of the legend. So I'm going to just click up where it says title and type trans uh, AMT for amount. We want to get rid of this page footer. So I'm going to just right click in the gray area and remove the page footer. And we're going to click to add title at the top. And we're going to put in a title of transaction amounts by location. And then you also have a map title right underneath that. And we can just delete that text box. And go ahead and run your report again. For a minimum transaction amount, let's put in 500. And for a maximum, let's try 10,000. And so you're seeing it did kind of filter it using the parameters for us on the map, but the legend, for some reason, there's a glitch in the system where the legend is not going to update correctly. And it's a known issue right now in report builder. It's not a workaround for it. So you might want to just do without the legend until they get that resolved, but we can leave it there for now. Go back to design view and save. Now we're going to talk about report parts. So report parts, you're able to do these in both report designer and report builder. After you create tables, charts, and other paginated report items in a project, you can publish them as a report part to a report server or SharePoint site integrated with the report server so that they can be reused in other reports. This is a huge efficiency item. The items that you can publish as report charts, as listed on the slides, you have charts, gauges, images, maps, parameters, rectangles, tables, matrices, and lists. We are going to publish our map as a report part. So when you publish a report part, it's assigned a unique ID, and it maintains that ID no matter what else is changed about it. It links the original report item in your report to the report part. When other authors reuse the report part, the ID also links the report part in their report to the report part. So I have a link here. There are slight differences between how the capabilities of this in report designer and report builder. And you can go to the website to look for more detailed information. We're going to publish our map as a report part in Report Builder. The process of publishing report parts is fairly straightforward in both Report Builder and Report Designer. We don't need to have our map selected in order to do this. We're simply going to go to the File tab of the ribbon, and we're going to choose Publish Report Parts. So you have two choices on this screen. You can publish all report parts with default settings, or you can review and modify report parts before publishing. We're going to select review and modify. So you can see exactly from this report, 
the report parts that it's able to publish. So we have our map, we have our max and min amount parameters, and we have our map data data set. You can also edit the title and description in here before you publish. So we could have renamed our map from the default map one. We could have done that in the properties pane, but we can also do it in here. So let's change that map from map one. Let's change the name to sales map. And then if you do the little right pointing arrow, you can expand that and it gives you a little preview of it. And you have the ability to write a description of the report part to help identify it. So we'll just put this map identifies transaction amounts by sales locations. It lets you know that it's going to be in a report parts folder on the report server. You can expand your max amount parameter. We're not going to put a description in here, but notice the icons in here. I'm going to collapse max amount and the map. And you can see the icon for a map is the globe. Your max and min amount icons are the same as they are in the parameters folder for a parameter. And then you have at the bottom, your data set. We have one data set that we're using for this particular map. So we're going to check the data sets. If you had multiples that would select all of them and we'll expand the data set. And in the description, we'll put spatial location data by customer ID from the wide world importers database. And we can collapse that. And now all we have to do at the bottom is click on publish. You'll get green check marks on the right when everything has been published. It lets you know at the bottom, the results, nothing failed to publish four parts published successfully and we can close this box. And now I'm on my report server in SSRS, and I'm going to do control R to refresh. And when I do that, the only thing I'll see in this SSRS video course folder is the map data data set. If I go to the home link, there's my report parts folder. And I want to move that folder into the SSRS video course folder. So I'm going to click its ellipsis button and choose move and select SSRS video course, and then just select. So now when I open that folder, everything is in there. I might have to refresh. Nope, there it is, our report parts folder. So one of the things I wanna do while we're here, except for report parts, these other folders are from Visual Studio, from Report Designer. Everything else on this page, except for the logo at the bottom that we uploaded is from Report Builder. So I just want to be, have a little bit more clarity here under folders, go to the ellipsis on data sources and choose manage. And at the end of the name, you're going to just type VS and then click apply. We're going to go back and I can use the link here to get back to SSRS video course folder. And do the same thing with the data sets folder that's there. Put a VS at the end of it. I just like to take a moment to say that it's really key that you keep your SSRS web portal well organized. You don't want everything just out on the home page. Makes it very difficult 
to navigate. Since we're in Report Builder and since it's a different process, I want to show you how to insert a logo into a report in this application. So let's go ahead and go to the File tab and we're going to do Open and we're going to reopen our Sales Info RB report. So we're going to add a page header section by right clicking in the gray area add page header. We're going to right click in the header section, hover over insert and choose image. Now here earlier, we did an embedded image. Now we're going to do external and we're going to browse and notice it takes us right up to our report server where we uploaded the learn it logo. So it has to be uploaded in order to be accessed from within report builder but it's stored locally in that source repos folder for Visual Studio and Report Designer. So I'm going to just double click Learn It Logo. I'm going to give it a name, Learn It Logo. And I'm going to do the tool tip. Please visit learnit.com for your training needs. And I'm going to put my exclamation point. And now I'm going to click OK. So now I'm going to move the logo over to the right. And I'm going to resize it. Eh, a little bit too big, but there we go. And now I'm going to go ahead and I don't need that much space. So I can put my mouse on this dash line here and kind of jog it up just a little bit. Maybe if I move this up at a jog up more, let's see. Yeah. So we don't need that much space in the page header section. And now go ahead and run. Select the start date for your report. and you'll see your logo. Go back to design view and save. In this module, we did some more data formatting as we've been doing throughout the course. Then we moved into uploading images and adding images to report items. We ultimately did that in both Report Builder and Report Designer because it was a different process. And then we moved on and built a chart report. After that, we got into more visualizations, data bars, spark lines, indicators, gauges, and maps. And then we ultimately saved our map and the parameters attached to it and its data set as a report part that can be reused in other reports. Thank you for attending the SSRS video course. In conclusion, what did we cover? In module four, we started working with reporting services data by applying data filters and report parameters. So when you apply a data filter, say for example, to a Tablix data region, every time that report is run, it's going to be filtered. Report parameters give the end users more capability to determine what data they want to see. In module five, we started creating visualizations. It's listed here that we would be formatting data, but we were doing that throughout the course whenever we were working on reports. And lesson two, we started adding images and chart reports. And then in lesson three, we got into data bar, spark lines, indicators, gauges, and we created our map report using the map wizard. Hi everyone, I'm Trish Connor Cato. Welcome to Analyzing Data with SQL Server Reporting Services, also referred to as SSRS. This video course is for those who will be the administrators of SSRS and who need to create dynamic paginated reports using the reporting tools. 
You'll also learn the SSRS administrative tasks during the course. When we begin the course, there is a Word document in the video description that I will review with you before we get started into the course. In this Word document, you'll find all the requirements, software requirements necessary to get your system ready for this course, as well as the links and instructions to download and configure software as necessary. In Module 6, you'll learn several ways to summarize report data. These include sorting and grouping, sub-reports, and the concept of drill down on a report. You will also create a drill-through report, which is actually two separate reports. Module 7 dives into sharing reporting services reports. In this module, you'll learn about schedules, then move into report caching, snapshots, and comments. The module ends with report subscription and delivery. When we get to Module 8, you'll learn how to administer reporting services via tasks. These tasks include the configuration of the web portal and web service, branding the web portal, and ensuring that access to sensitive reports is carefully controlled. Administrators also monitor and optimize performance. We'll be using the Report Service Configuration Manager during this module. As the amount of data we need to deal with increases, so does the requirement to manage data by grouping and summarizing. In this module, you'll learn how to create group structures, summarize data, and provide interactivity in your reports so that users can see the level of detail or summary that they need. We're gonna start this module with learning how to sort your data, move on to the interactivity in lessons two and three, which include report subreports and nested data regions, and drill down and drill through capabilities in reporting. To control the sort order of data in your report, you can sort data in a dataset query or define a sort expression for a data region or group. You can also add interactive sort buttons to tables and matrices to enable a user to change the sort order for rows, depending on their needs. The default sort order is based on the query being used in the dataset. You can use the order by clause in the query if you want to change the default sort order. You can also use a query to determine a custom sort order by using a case statement in a query. We're gonna be working in Report Designer for this one, and we'll be working on our Sales Info VS report. So we're gonna talk about doing our sorting here. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna select the table, right click on the gray border of it, and go into Tablix Properties. This is just like what we did when we filtered on a Tablix. And so we're on the left side, this time we're gonna to go to sorting. We're gonna choose add at the top. And we're gonna do the drop down for sort by, and we're gonna choose quantity. And we're gonna change the order over to the right, it's in ascending order. We want it in descending order. So we're gonna do the drop down and select Z to A. We're gonna click OK and go ahead and preview your report. Just put in the start and end dates of your choice. So I've used January 1st, 2016 through May 31st, 2016. And you can see that my quantities are now displaying in descending order in their order date and order ID groups. Let's go back to design view. At this point, anytime this report is run, the sort order for quantity is going to be in descending order. We wanna give the end user the ability to switch between ascending and descending order for the quantity column. And we're gonna set up an interactive sorting. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna right click on the quantity column heading and we're gonna choose text box properties. 
On the left side, we're going to go to interactive sorting. We're going to enable it by using that top checkbox. We're going to leave it on detail rows under choose what to sort. And then for sort by, we're going to go to the drop down and choose quantity. And we can click OK at the bottom. Let's go ahead and preview this again. And you'll be able to see where the end user will be able to change the sort order to meet their needs. If you look to the right of your quantity column heading, you have your up and down arrow. So we're in descending order, which is what we set up in Tablix. If we click the arrow, it will switch between ascending and descending order. And that gives the end user more capability in terms of what they need to see when they run this report. We can go back to design view and save. So now I'm going to have you Go back to Report Builder and reopen your Sales Info RB report. I'd like you on your own to set up a descending order sort on the quantity column and then set up an interactive sort on the quantity column. The process is exactly the same in Report Builder as it is in Report Designer. When you're done and you run your report, it should look like mine on my screen. Before we get into the next lesson, I just wanted to go over some definitions beforehand. So we're getting ready to create report sub reports. A sub report is a report item that displays another report inside the body of a main paginated report. Conceptually, a sub report in a report is like a frame in a web page. It's used to embed a report within a report. Any report can be used as a sub-report. The report that is displayed as the sub-report is stored on a report server, usually in the same folder as the parent report. You can design the parent report to pass parameters to the sub-report. And a sub-report can be repeated within data regions using a parameter to filter data in each instance of the sub-report. So you can nest one data region in a paginated report, such as a chart inside another data region, such as a matrix, typically to display data summaries in a concise manner or to provide a visual display as well as a table or matrix display. By providing plus and minus icons on a text box, you can enable users in a paginated report to hide and display items interactively. This is called a drill down action. For a table or matrix, you can show or hide static rows and columns or rows and columns that are associated with groups. Then we have a drill through report. And that is a report that a user opens by clicking a link within another paginated report. Drill through reports commonly contain details about an item that is contained in an original summary report. I'll give you a few moments to review these comparisons on this slide, and then I have another slide with comparisons for you as well to review. So pause the video, review this slide, and then also review the rest of the comparisons on this slide. So now we're going to get started building a report sub-report. We're actually going to be building two reports and connecting them. So we're going to design our main report first, and we're going to do this in Report Builder. It's the same process pretty much in Report Designer. So we're going to just make sure our Sales Info RB report is saved. We're going to go to the File tab of the menu and choose New. And we're going to choose a blank report. You'll be pleased to hear that we're going to be using a different query. So let's switch over to SQL Server Management Studios. And we're going to grab 
the supplier categories query. And you see the query results. If you don't have the results on the bottom, go ahead and execute the query or press F5 to execute the query. And we decide that we want this sorted by supplier category ID. So instead of adding a sort, you know, at the tablix level, we're going to build the sort into this query. So underneath the last line, the from purchasing dot supplier categories, we're going to type order by it's two separate words. And then we're going to give it the supplier category ID field, which if you start typing it in, it should pop up on the list and you can just select it. So we want these sorted by supplier category ID. The default sort order is ascending. If you wanted it descending, you would have to type DESC, but we want it in ascending. So I'm going to just execute this. And now you can see in the results that it's in ascending order. So I'm going to then control a C to select and copy that query and switch back over to report builder. And we'll be using that query for our data set in building our main report here. We're going to right click in a blank area, hover over insert and go ahead and choose table for this one. We're going to name our data set supplier categories. And we want to embed it in our report. We're going to use our regular shared data source. So we're going to click on new and I'm going to select mine. And actually we're going to name that data source shared. And again, we can test the connection here and it's created successfully and we can do okay. Now we're going to paste in our query, which already contains the order by clause. So the information will be in that order and we're going to click okay. Let's move our table framework to the upper left corner and expand our data set folder. And we just want the supplier category name field in this table. So we can delete the other two columns and we want to expand the width of that supplier category name column. Let's delete the title placeholder text box and we can then move our table up more. We can also right click on a gray area and remove the page footer. We want to center the supplier category name and the detail row. So I'm going to just select both of those and go up to the ribbon and choose the center. And we're going to change the heading to say suppliers by category. Let's format that header row. So I'm going to select the row handle for the header row. And we're going to give it a blue fill and white bold 14 point font. So I'm going to handle my font first, white, bold, 14 point. And then I'm going to do my fill color to a light blue color. Click away from it. Now it looks like it's cutting off the G 
and the bottoms of the peas and suppliers. So I'm gonna make that row a little bit taller so we can see the full thing. We're gonna format the detail row this time as well. So I'm gonna make that a lighter blue fill color than the one that I have or just a contrasting blue. I don't wanna to go too dark though. And I'm also gonna give it white font and make the font bold. So this is our main table, right? That we'll be able to access the sub report from. So what we have to do to make space for the sub report is we're going to select the detail row header right click on it, insert row. And now we have multiple choices, inside group above and below and outside group above and below. We want inside group below. So it's still within the same framework. And let's go ahead and run this report so we can see the results. So the supplier names are in the order of their supplier IDs. And that's what we set up in the query. Let's go back to design view. I've gone ahead and saved my report. I named it supplier categories and it's in the SSRS video course folder. And I decided I wanna make a couple of formatting changes. I'm not happy with two things in particular. The first thing is I don't want the row, the new row we added to hold the sub report to be shaded. So I'm gonna just select that row and give it no color. And then I'm gonna just change the color of my header row. I'm not really liking that color combination. So I'm gonna give that a different color. And now I'm gonna resave. Now that our main report is designed, we're gonna leave it and design our sub report. And then we'll come back to our main report to embed the sub report within it. So we're already saved. We're gonna to go to the file tab and choose new, and we're gonna do another blank report. So now we're gonna switch over to SQL Server Management Studios and grab a different query. And by the way, if you wanna save that order by clause in the supplier categories query, you can right click on its tab and choose save at the top. We want the supplier contact information query. And you can see that this query is ordered by supplier category ID. And we can leave that there, that's not gonna make a difference. We can select it and copy it and then make our way back to Report Builder. This is also going to be a table. So we're just gonna right click, Insert Table. We're gonna name this data set Supplier Contact info and we're going to want it to be embedded we're going to click on new to grab our shared data source which we can call shared i'm going to call this one shared one and i'm going to select the appropriate one test my connection okay and okay and then go ahead and paste the query and we can OK. We're gonna move the table to the upper left corner. We're gonna delete the title placeholder and move the table to the upper left corner. And then we're gonna expand our data set folder And we want all of the fields 
accept supplier category ID in our table. Let's expand the width of the supplier name column. And we can give it a very light background color. Remembering that it's gonna show up, I'm gonna kind of make it like a light gray background color for that row. And I'm gonna make the font in that row bold. Let's right click in the gray area and remove the page footer. So now we're gonna set up a parameter in a different way than we've done before. Let's right click on the parameters folder in the report data pane and choose add parameter. So all the other times we've been doing query parameters, right? We've been modifying the query to create our parameters by adding the where clause. And now we're gonna do this one a different way. We're gonna name the parameter supplier category ID. We don't have to worry about the prompt because we're gonna make this a hidden parameter. So we're gonna go down to the bottom after we name it and we're gonna select the option button for hidden. And go ahead and change the data type to integer. And we're gonna go ahead and click okay. So this is where we get to insert our sub report. We're gonna click in that blank row that we created right click in it. We're gonna to go to the bottom and hover over insert and on the list is sub report. Now we're gonna right click on sub report and go to sub report properties. We'll name the report supplier contact and we're gonna click on the browse button underneath use this report as a sub report. And we're gonna select our supplier contact info report that we just created. And the last thing we need to do is go to the parameters tab on the left and we're gonna add, we're gonna do the drop down for name and we'll see our parameter that we created in the sub report there. And over for the value, we're gonna drop down and select supplier category ID. And we can click okay. And we can go ahead and run our report. And you can see that it has, so the other wholesaler category doesn't have a supplier in it. And then it goes to novelty goods. So you're seeing all of the suppliers in that category and their contact information so on and so forth. Now I will say that we should clean up this blank space on the right side of the report. It's kind of distracting. So let's go back to design view. And I believe that blank space needs to be cleaned up in the sub report. So let's save this report, go back to file, open, open our supplier contact info report and let's get rid of the blank space on the right. We got rid of the blank space on the bottom before. Let's save it. Go back to file open and reopen our supplier categories report. And I'm gonna run it before I get rid of blank space here. Yeah, so it was in the sub report that that was causing that extra blank space. So we can go back to design view and save. Now that we have our sub report together, we're gonna move on and create a drill down report. So let's start by going to the file tab and we're clicking new and we're gonna select the blank report template. Now, 
let's actually right click in a blank area of the report and insert a table. We're going to use our shared data set and we'll just call it shared and click OK at the bottom. We're going to move the table to the upper left hand corner and we're going to build this up. Instead of dragging the fields into the table, we're going to do something different here. Let's first right click in a gray area and remove the page footer. And where it says click to add title, let's just call it drill down report. Now, just as a reminder, drill down is an action. It's actually set via properties and it can be performed on all reports via plus and minus icons on a text box, which enables users to hide and display items interactively. So what we want to do is expand our data set and we're going to use almost all of the fields here in the data set, except for the quarter field, but we're not going to drag them into the table framework. What we're going to do is make sure your grouping pane is open at the bottom. If it's not, you can right click in a gray area view grouping. And we're going to drag the order date field down into the row groups pane above details. Then we're going to drag order year underneath order date in row groups. Order ID is next. Quantity. Stock item ID. And stock item name. So all of those are in row groups in order above details. Now we're going to drag transaction amount into the blank column to the right of stock item name in your table framework. Now we end up with two extra columns, which we're going to select right click and delete. And we're going to decrease the width of the order year column as well as order ID. Stock item ID can be decreased. Quantity can be decreased a little bit as well, I think. And stock item name, we want to expand. And we might want to expand transaction amount a little bit as well. We'll see when we run it, we can always come back and make these adjustments. So what makes this a drill down? In your row groups panel, you're going to click on stock item name. And over to the right in the properties pane, the last property is toggle item. You're going to click in toggle item and select the drop down, and you're going to scroll down and select the quantity field. So what we're saying here is we're going to have plus minus signs on the quantity field. And if we collapse the field, it's going to hide stock item names. That's what our goal is here. So now go ahead and save your report. And we'll call it drill down report. Make sure you put it in the right folder. And then go ahead and run it. So if you look in the quantity column, you'll see plus signs to the left of all the quantities. If I click on a plus sign, it collapses it. So I'm not seeing the stock item name. So maybe in my job, the name doesn't matter to me. I just need all the other details, or maybe sometimes I need to see the name and sometimes I don't. So this is an example of a drill down action, which you set using that toggle item property on your report. And we can go back to design view. Before we get into our drill through report, I just want to restate that a drill through is similar to a report sub report, except it opens another report by clicking a link. So it's typically a link within an original summary report. And when you click the link, you get details contained in the drill through target report. So we're going to get this set up now. 
We're going to create a new blank report. But before we do that, go over to SSMS and copy your drill through query. And we're going to create a new blank report and go ahead and insert a table. We're going to name this data set stock items and it's going to be embedded in our report. We're going to click on new and select our shared data source and we can just name that shared. Test your connection and OK. Go ahead and paste in your drill through query and we're going to click OK. So now let's do a couple of things. Let's remove the title text box and right click and remove your page footer. And let's move our table to the upper left hand corner and expand our data set folder. We're going to add all of the fields from our data set into the table. And I'm just doing them in the order that they're in. And then we need to adjust some table widths. So we want to make stock item name as wide as possible. Supplier name, we want to widen that. Unit price might be okay. Color name might be okay. We will find out when we take a look at it. Let's go ahead and give our header row a fill. And you can make your color choices here. We want to give it a fill color and we want to give it white, bold, 14 point font. For the second row, we'll make it a lighter fill color and bold 12 point font. And if you want to change your font color, you can. I'm going to leave mine black. And I'm just going to give it a lighter blue. Let's format unit price as currency. Get rid of the white space. And let's access our data set properties. So now we're going to set up some parameters for some ID fields. And so we want to go in front of group by press enter and up arrow. And it's going to be where PS dot supplier ID. And that's from the purchasing dot suppliers table in that database equals we're going to do our at symbol and name the parameter supplier ID. We're going to use the and keyword and come down to the next line and we're going to do WC dot color ID equals at color ID. So we just created a supplier ID and a color ID parameter and we're going to go ahead and click OK. So you see them in the parameters pane. We are going to right click and add a page header and insert a text box in the header now. Again, this is going to display the values. Well, it's actually going to be informational for the end users. Our color IDs and supplier IDs are each different ranges. So we're going to just put that information in this text box. So I'm going to move the text box to the upper left hand corner and expand it. And in it, I'm going to type supplier ID equals and then in parentheses, I'm going to put 1-13. So in that Wide World Importer database, there's 13 supplier IDs. 
And then I'm going to put a space and a slash and a space color ID equals and in parentheses, the color IDs range from one to 36. So one dash 36, just informational there for the end user. And then I'm going to get rid of that extra space underneath the text box. I'm going to make the text in the text box bold. And let's see what happens when we run this one. So let's use a supplier ID of four and a color ID of 35 and run your report. So this is what we're getting. We're getting based on that supplier, which is Fabricam ink and the color is white. So 35 is the white color. And let's clear those boxes and we'll put other numbers in and run it again. So let's this time, let's do a supplier ID of 10 and a color ID of three and run it. So you can see a different supplier, different color there. And let's go back to design view. So ultimately the parameter values will be passed into this report. This is the target report. And we're gonna make some adjustments to our parameters. So let's go ahead and go into parameter properties for supplier ID. We're gonna change the data type to integer. Underneath that, we're going to check the box that says allow null value. We're going to make the parameter hidden. And then on the left, we're going to go to the default values tab. And we're going to select specify values. We're going to add, and it's going to pop in a null value and we're going to leave it like that. We're going to click okay. We're going to do the same changes for color ID. So we're going to make it an integer data type, allow no value, make it hidden, add a default value that you're going to specify and accept the null value. And now if we run the report, you'll see that you get absolutely no results. So we have to go and modify the query, the where clause of the query a little bit. So let's go back to design view, right click on your data set and go to its properties. So in that where clause, we're gonna modify it. So I'll walk you through this and then I'll leave it on the screen for a moment after we're done so you can see it and double check it against yours. After where, we're gonna put an opening parenthesis in front of ps.supplierid. And then we're gonna go to, after it says at supplier ID and before and, we're gonna click and we're gonna type the or keyword, another at symbol, supplier ID again, and then the keywords is null and close the parenthesis after is null. We'll get through it and then I'll explain it. And then we're going to go down to the next line that starts with wc.colorid. We're going to leave that and statement after is null. And we're going to do an open parenthesis in front of wc.colorid. We're gonna go after the at color ID, type the or keyword at color ID, and we're gonna type is null again and close the parentheses. So let me start by addressing the parentheses. The parentheses are changing the order of operations here. We want the or statements to happen before the and statement. If we didn't do parentheses, it would do the and piece first because and takes precedence in the order of operations here. So that's about the parentheses. So we added on 
So when we created our parameter, we said ps.supplierID equals at supplier ID or at supplier ID is null. We're now allowing for the null value. If we don't do that, you see what happens. We get zero results. So go ahead and click OK. I'll leave mine on the screen for a moment so you can review it, make sure yours is correct. And when you're done, you can click OK. We'll run it again. And so we get a full list of everything. And we can go back to design view. Now this is the target report. So we need to save this report and we're going to name it drill through target. Now we're going to create our original summary report that will link to this drill through target report. So we're going to do that in the form of a chart. Let's go to file new and we'll do the blank template. We're going to right click and insert a chart and we're going to keep the default column chart that's already in there. Let's name the data set drill through and we're going to embed it. We're going to use our shared data source and we'll just name it shared. Test your connection as usual. And then hopefully it's still on your clipboard. We're going to paste in that drill through target query again. And we can go ahead and click OK. We can hide our parameters and grouping panes just to make some more room on our canvas here and remove the chart, the actual outside of the chart title and the page footer. And I'm going to move the chart over to the upper left, expand it. And now let's expand our data set and right click on it to get to data set properties. And we're going to add another line to this query and it's going to be, I'll put it. So up at the top, you have select WSI dot stock item name. The next line down is comma WC dot color name. Click at the end of color name and press enter and do a comma and type PS supplier ID. We want to add another field to this data set. Now we're going to have an issue if we don't add it to the group by clause. So in the group by clause, click after WC dot color name comma, and you're going to type the same thing. PS dot supplier ID and another comma and now do okay. So now you'll see supplier ID in the list of our data set names. So we're going to select the chart. So we get the chart data screen and we're going to do the plus sign to the right of category groups and add supplier ID there. So it's grouped by supplier ID. The next thing we're going to do is in the chart data pane, we're going to right click on supplier ID and go to category group properties. For the label, we're going to do the drop down and choose supplier name. And we're going to go to the sorting tab on the right and change the sort by to supplier name as well. And it's in ascending order and we'll click OK. We're going to do the plus sign next to values in chart data and select unit price. And we want to change the aggregate here from sum to average. So I'm going to do the drop down arrow next to some unit price, hover over aggregate and select average. Go ahead and run your report. 
So we're going to make some changes and fixes to it. We're going to keep building on it. But right now, I'd like you to hover over any column, and you'll notice that nothing shows. There's nothing that pops up when you hover over the columns. Let's go ahead and go back to Design View. Let's go ahead and save this. And we're going to name it Drill Through Summary. Now we're going to click where it says chart title within the chart and we're going to type, I'm going to get rid of that text <laughs> and we're going to type average unit price by supplier. We're going to delete the legend. So where it says unit price, you can just grab that whole box and delete it. Select the columns in the chart. So if you click on one, it will select all of them. And on the properties pane, you're going to go over to the color property and you're going to do the drop down where it says automatic. And I'm going to go to more colors link toward the bottom. So we saw our palettes earlier in the course, and I'm just going to select a palette that suits what I'd like to see. And I'm going to go bright orange on this one. We're going to adjust the labels underneath the columns. So you're going to select the label area and then right click, and you're going to go to horizontal axis properties. In here, we're going to change the interval to one from auto to one. And we don't necessarily need to do this, but I'll explain why we're doing it. So if you had a lot of items, you may not get a label. So if you had more items than we have, you may not get a label if the interval is set to auto. And we can click OK. Let's save our chart report again. Now we're going to address the issue of having something show when we hover over the columns. So the first thing we need to do in here, and I apologize for this, when we went and modified the query to show supplier ID, we should have done color ID at the same time. So we're going to right click on our data set and go to data set properties. And in the upper half of the screen, click before the comma WC color name field in the select list. So I'll point to it on my screen so you can see it a little bit better. We want to click before that WC dot color name field before the comma even. and press enter, and then use your up arrow. We're going to type comma WC dot color ID. And then in the group by clause at the bottom, we're going to click before WC color name, and we're going to type WC dot color ID and a comma. And now we'll click OK. We're not going to add the color ID into our chart, but we need to have it in our list. And so now we're ready to adjust our columns so that they have a tooltip that displays to the end user and connect this summary report to the drill through target report. And we're going to do that by right clicking on any column and going to series properties. The first thing we're going to do is create the tooltip. So on the default series data page, we're going to go over to the function button to the right of tooltip. And before we even start typing in the expression, in the category pane, you're going to double click fields so that all of our fields from the data set show in values. Now you can click after the equal sign and you're going to double click the supplier name field values in the values box type a space and an ampersand. And then you're going to type the word environment and a dot 
and then new line, which is all one word. There's several different things you could use in here, but I like using environment new line on occasion. So after the supplier name, it's going to have the next thing on a line underneath it. And we're going to do a space and an ampersand. And then we're going to select the color name values. So the fields color name value, a space and an ampersand, another space. We're going to type environment dot new line again, space ampersand. And finally, we're going to select the unit price field from the values box. So pause for a minute and make sure your expression looks like mine. And when it does, we can go ahead and click OK. Now on the left side of series properties, we're going to go to action and we're going to select the option button for go to report. We're going to browse and find our drill through target report. And then we need to add two parameters. So we're going to do add underneath that where it says use these parameters to run the report. For the name drop down, we're going to select supplier ID. And these are parameters that we set up in the target report. So supplier ID and the value is going to be supplier ID. We're going to add again and do the same for color ID with a value of color ID. And now that's how we pass the parameters and we're going to click OK. So now let's run our report. And if you hover over any column, you'll see our concatenated expression. So it's telling you the supplier, you hover over it again. Okay, so it's telling you the supplier, the color that's represented and the unit price. And because it is a drill through report, if you click on any of those columns, it will display the associated information from the drill through target report. Ta-da! And we can go back to design view and save. Now you'll have the opportunity to create another chart summary report. You're going to put it right underneath your column chart. So here's your directions on this slide and go ahead and start building that chart, the new chart, which is going to be a pie chart. And then when you're done, I will show you my end result. So when I run mine, I chose a 3D pie chart. When I hover over any slice, I see the supplier name. And when I click on a slice, it takes me to the information for that supplier in the drill through target report. I'm going to go back to design and make sure I save. Now we're going to do one other thing. Let's go over to SSRS, refresh if necessary. And so what you typically would want to do here is hide your drill through target report. It's only going to be accessed via the summary report. So we're going to go to the drill through target report, more info ellipses, and we're going to go to manage. And then we're going to hide this item. There's a checkbox that says hide this item and apply. So that way, the only way it will be accessed is via the summary report. And then we can cancel out of that. So you don't see drill through target out here. So by way of recapping module six, summarizing report data, we started with how to sort data and we actually got to do it, changing the default sort order in a table. And we also set up interactive sorting and we changed the sort order via a query as well, using the order by clause in a query. In lesson two, we created a report sub report. We started out by creating the main report. We left a row empty in the main report 
in order to embed the sub report that we then went and created. So we used a table within a table and that is a nested data region, but we could have also used the chart in that one. So you got to see how you can embed a report within another report. And in lesson three, we went over drill down, which is an action that is set by a property. So the end user could expand the level of detail they're seeing in a report by using the plus and or minus buttons. And then we got into drill through. We created our drill through target report first, and we set up some parameters in it. We passed the parameters to our drill through summary report, and we were able to see how we can connect them in that way. And so we use the action for that. And then you had the ability to create another drill through summary report within the original drill through summary report. You got to create another chart on your own that you actually connect it to the drill through target and you set a tool tip for the pie slices. When you have published a reporting services report, users can view the report interactively in SSRS. In some situations, it can be advantageous to run reports automatically, either to improve performance through caching and snapshots, or to deliver reports to users by using email or other mechanisms. To run reports automatically, you need to understand how reporting services manages scheduling. This module covers report scheduling, caching, and automatic subscription and delivery of reports. So we have three lessons in this module sharing reporting services reports. In the first lesson, we'll get into schedules. Lesson two will be about reports, caching, snapshots, and comments. And then we'll end up with report subscription and delivery. Schedules in SSRS have many uses. They're mostly used, well, I won't say mostly, but generally speaking, I think that more people use them for report delivery in a standard or data-driven subscription. And you'll see the difference between standard or data-driven subscription shortly. They can also be used to schedule report history so that new snapshots are added to report history at regular intervals. Snapshots are a picture of a report at a certain space in time that remains static in a snapshot. So you can go back and look at the history of your data. They can be used to schedule when to refresh the data of a report snapshot and when to refresh the data of a shared data set. Schedules can also be used to schedule the expiration of a cached report or shared data set to occur at a predefined time so that it can be subsequently refreshed. Now there are two different schedule types in SSRS. There's shared and report specific schedules. Shared schedules are created as separate items. After they're created, they can be referenced when defining a subscription or other scheduled operations. A shared schedule can be used by any number of published reports and subscriptions. When you delete a shared schedule and use by multiple reports and subscriptions, the report server creates individual schedules for those reports and subscriptions. The details in the shared schedule are transferred to the individual schedules. And then there are report specific schedules. They're created when you define a subscription or set report execution properties. The two types of subscriptions are standard and data driven. The standard report subscription SSRS generates a report and delivers it based on schedule and delivery method, email or file share, for example. For a data driven subscription, we can use data or the report parameters values from the SQL query. There are two things that we need to do before we're gonna to go to SSRS and start creating schedules, we need to redeploy our solution in Visual Studio. We haven't redeployed it, and we wanna make sure that all of our reports 
are up there and our data sets and all of that are updated if necessary. So I'm back in Visual Studio and Solution Explorer toward the top, I'm gonna right click on that Solution Sales Information VS one of one project line and deploy the solution. So your build window will open at the bottom and it lets me know that my deployment was successful. The next thing we have to do is make sure that the SQL Server agent is set to automatically run. So we need to make sure it's started and then we'll set it to automatic. So I'll direct you on how to get there. And basically what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go to the search screen and I'm gonna type SQL and as soon as I type SQL, the SQL Server Configuration Manager comes up and I'm gonna select that app. So on the left side, if I click on SQL Server Services, I'll see my SQL Server agent in the list. And again, I have multiple installations, so I'm pointing to the right one for my version that I'm using for this course. And mine is already running and its start mode is already automatic. If yours is not, not running, you can double click it. And down at the bottom, you can click on start. And then you can go to the service tab up top. And where it says start mode, you can do the drop down and select automatic. And then you just want to apply an OK out of there and you can close your SQL Server Configuration Manager. Now, since my Visual Studio is still open, I'm gonna go ahead and close down that build menu. And now we're ready to switch to SSRS. So I'm in my SSRS video course folder and I've refreshed after deploying and if I open the sales information VS folder, I only see two reports in there. So I'm going to go to the home. I'm actually going to go back to the SSRS video course link. And I am going to grab that more info ellipses for sales information VS. And I'm going to delete that folder because if I click on the home link, this is where it deployed it to. And if I click on this one, you'll see I have all three reports there. So I'm going to move sales information VS from home into SSRS video course. And then I can go back into that folder and all of my things are in there that I need for right now. Well, actually, no, it's not because I didn't grab the data sources and data sets, but they haven't changed. So what I can do is I can delete them from the home screen because they're already, we haven't changed them at all. And they're already in that SSRS video course folder with the appropriate VS behind them. So now we're ready to start working with our schedules. And we access them in the upper right hand corner of your screen by using the gear icon. And when you click on the gear, you're going to select site settings. And on the left side, you have schedules. So this is the screen that we're going to be working on. We want to add a new schedule. So we're going to do the plus sign and you give your schedules a name. We're gonna call it Sales Information Project. And then you have a schedule details section. Choose whether to run the report on an hourly, daily, weekly, monthly, or one-time basis. And so our choice here is going to be, we're gonna select daily. And then once you select day, it's going to give you a daily schedule section and you have options there on specific days, every weekday, or repeat after this number of days. 
we're going to select on the following days or every weekday. We'll just do Monday through Friday at this point. And then after that, you give it a start time. When do you want the schedule to run? So I'm going to have the schedule run in a low traffic time. So I'm going to leave it at 2 a.m. And then we'll select begin running this schedule on. We'll do the little mini calendar. And I'm going to go to the next day from whatever day you're watching this video. And at the bottom, I'm not going to stop the schedule on a specific date. If I need to come back in here and modify anything, I can. I'm going to do apply at the bottom. So now I have this schedule sitting here waiting for use. And if you come back to schedules from site settings, you'll have that edit button there that you can use to get back and edit any of the information for that particular schedule. When we get to lesson three about subscriptions, we'll be revisiting the schedule that we just created. We'll be connecting schedules and subscriptions. So lesson two is about caching, snapshots, and comments. So caching, uh, the report server can cache a copy of a process report and return that copy when a user opens the report. Caching can shorten the time required to retrieve a report if the report is large or accessed frequently. A cached report is not persisted. It does have a lifetime, and you can only have one instance per report or one per combination of parameters. And you're going to learn how this works in just a moment. And then there are snapshots. I briefly described them earlier. It's a report that contains layout information and query results that were retrieved at a specific point in time. A snapshot is a persistent copy of the report stored for good on the report database. You could have as many as you need. And then there are comments. As of SQL Server 2017, end users now have the added functionality of adding comments to reports in SSRS. Comments can be replied to and a conversation about a report can be conducted via the comments. Attachments can be added to comments in SSRS as well. So now we're going to set up caching for a data set. So let's go to our sales info data set, more info ellipsis button, and we're going to choose manage. And on the left side, you're going to select caching. So by default, it always runs the data set with the most recent data. If you have a large amount of data or the report is very popular and it's accessed by lots of people at the same time, it can speed up the process by caching copies of it. So we're going to select the option button for cache copies of this data set and use them when available. And again, caches are not persisted, so the cache will expire. You can expire it after a certain amount of minutes, or you can expire it based on a schedule. Let's click on cache expires on a schedule, and you have a choice of a report specific schedule or a shared schedule. If you're using report specific, you can edit the schedule here. We're going to select the option button for shared schedule and then you'll see our shared schedule that we just created listed. And at the bottom, we're going to apply. And so the cache will only be good until that schedule runs. And then another cache will be created and only be good until that schedule runs. And we're going to use what I call the breadcrumb trail at the top to get back to the SSRS video course folder. In SSRS, you can set a cache for a data set and a report, but when it comes to history snapshots, you can only set those up for reports. So we're going to set a history snapshot for our drill down report. We're going to go to its more info and manage. And on the left side, you can see that you can cache here, but we're going to do history snapshots. And then the upper left, we're going to select new history snapshot. 
and it's creating a snapshot of that report with the data as it is right now. Once it's done creating the snapshot, you can click the link that says view history snapshot, and it will load the report as it is right now in this moment in time. And I'm gonna use the breadcrumb trail to get back to SSRS video course. So caches expire and snapshots do not, they are persisted and you can have as many snapshots as you need for a particular report. Let's go back to more info for the drill down report and go back to manage. And this time you might want to take a few moments to just look at some of the other items here. So it's letting you know if there's any shared data sets. We haven't assigned any subscriptions to reports. We have no dependent items on this report. We didn't put a cache here, but we did the history snapshots. And we're gonna revisit security again a little bit later. So for reports, these are the things that you have on the manage menu. We're going to go back to SSRS video course. Now we want to add some comments for the drill down report. So we don't do that from the more info ellipsis. We actually launch the report by just clicking on its tile. When the report loads, if you look up in the upper right hand corner underneath your user name, you'll see the comments bubble. So, we're gonna click on comments and the add comment panel opens on the right. You can see we don't have a need to, but you could see that you could attach a file here. And I'm gonna just click in the box that says start typing. And I'm gonna say this report allows you to show slash hide stock item names when clicking the icon to the left of the quantity field. And I'm gonna post the comment. So it says whose comment it is, and then people can reply and you can have a conversation about reports. And it's kind of a good way to get feedback from users. I would encourage your users to use the comments feature so that you can see what works for them, what doesn't work for them. And we're gonna just use the breadcrumb trail to get back to the SSRS video course folder. Before we can get into report subscription and delivery, we have to add some user accounts and groups. I have some dummy accounts set up in Windows. And so I'm gonna have you add the users on this slide and two different groups, and you're gonna add two different users to each of the two groups. And I will show you my Windows groups in just a few moments, but I'm getting there by just going, right-clicking on the desktop, going to personalize and going to settings and then finding accounts and starting to add them. So from the desktop, I right-clicked, I went to personalize, and I'm typing in users in the search box and I'm gonna select add, edit, or remove other users. So you can see that I have these users added. And if I go to add someone else to this PC, I can show you that I have that associate sales and manager sales groups added. And when I double click on this, I have to add the users to these groups, but my users are already set up. So when I go to users, I'll just tell you how I did it. If you look at it here, I created a user called, for example, manager sales A, and I named the full name manager space sales A, that kind of thing. So that's what I'm asking you to do. And I just noticed that I don't have my associate sales users here. So I'm going to add those back in by going to the action menu and choosing new user and then it's gonna be associate sales A, and then the full name associate space sales 
A. I'm giving my users passwords and confirming them and saying the password never expires so I don't have to keep doing this. But anyway, that's what I'm going to set up. So you need to set up those users this way and I'll put the slide back up for you and you can pause and get them set up. Now, another account that I have in here is a training account. I just named it training and it actually has a valid email address attached to it. So just so you know, an extra account with an email address that you can access would be great. And again, this is just for training purposes at this point. Now that we have our accounts set up, there are some settings that we need to review and report server configuration manager. So on the left side, I'm going to just go down the list. The service account is already set up. You have your web service URL already set up. Your database is set up or we wouldn't have gotten too far in this course, as well as the web portal URL. Now we're going to talk about email settings. So if you want to use report server email, you have to specify an existing server and an email account that can send email from that server. So this is where you would use your email sender address if you wanted to be able to make use of this functionality. This is where I'm going to use my training account that I set up that has an email address attached to it. So that's the address I'm going to be using. So I got a message when I went to apply that I didn't put it in the right format. So it has to be the domain and then the account. So when I changed to the appropriate syntax and applied, it saved it. The other setting on um, the last setting on the left, Power BI service, let's take a look at this. So I'm already registered with the Power BI service. This gives you the ability to enable hybrid cloud features across the two. When this report server is registered, users can sign into their Power BI accounts and pin paginated report items to their Power BI dashboards. So if you have need of the integration between report server and Power BI report server, you would need to register with Power BI in here. Next thing you're gonna need to do is set up a folder on your system for file sharing. So a file share folder, probably on a shared network drive would be the easiest way to do it. And once you set it up, you want to go to the sharing tab and make sure you copy the network path. You'd also want to go to the security tab and add users that will have access to it. And then you can share it from the sharing tab and copy its network path. Once you have that done, we're ready to create our subscription in SSRS. In SSRS, we're going to go to the more info button for the drill down paginated report, and we're going to choose subscribe. We're going to name this subscription sales info, and we're going to use a standard subscription. We're going to use our shared schedule that we created. So we're going to do that option button and our shared schedule populates. If you had multiples, of course, you could use the drop down to select the one you want. We didn't set up email delivery. So we're going to use Windows file share as a destination. And so now you have delivery options for Windows file share. We're going to paste in that UNC path that we copied when you created your file share folder and you went to properties and the share tab. You can take a look at the render formats in the list. We're going to leave it on Word. And then you have to give the credentials for the file share username and password. So it has to be in the form of domain name.
and then a backslash and the name of the account. And then you have to input the password as well. Now your override options at the bottom, it defaults to overwrite any existing file with a newer version when the schedule runs. Or you can over, do not overwrite the file if a previous version exists. So you'll get two versions of the file. Or you can increment file names as newer versions are added. So you get different versioning. We're going to leave it on overwrite and then go down and click on create subscription. In order to get to your subscriptions, you can use your gear and you have my subscriptions. In my subscriptions, without even selecting it, you can edit your subscription, you can launch the report that it's attached to, and you can navigate to your SSRS video course folder. If you select the checkbox in front of your subscription, you will see the toolbar becomes available to you. So you can come in and disable a subscription temporarily, and then come back in and enable it. You can delete a subscription that is no longer needed. And you can also search if you had a lot of subscriptions for a particular subscription. And you also have the run now icon, which if you want to run it off of its regular schedule, you can use, you can actually click run now, now, and then I'm going to go back. If you notice to the right, it says the result is running. I'm going to just go back to the home screen. Now there's something else you can go back and check the status of your subscription on your own later, but there's another setting in here. I think it's important for you to know about. So this time we're going to go to the gear and select my settings. And there is a connect to power BI setting. So we saw the power BI setting in report server configuration manager, that if you're registered with power BI there, you'll be able to share paginated reports to power BI dashboards. This setting under my settings allows end users to sign into their power BI accounts. So they get access to their dashboards. And we can go back home. So to recap module seven, we started in SSRS by setting up a schedule for report delivery. Then we went on to learning about and setting up report caching snapshots and adding comments to a report. And then we went into report subscription and delivery. We had to set up some accounts for this, which we had already done. And then we needed to set a file share folder on our system. And we reviewed some of the report server configuration manager settings that deal with this. So we set up a file share account via the subscription settings in there. And then we went to SSRS and set up a subscription for a particular report and pointed it to the Windows file share folder that we had set. Our eighth module has two lessons, administering reporting services and reporting services performance. When we talk about administrative tasks in SSRS, they include the configuration of the web portal and web service, which you've already done through report service configuration manager, or you wouldn't have made it this far in the course. We've been up on the web portal with our folders and everything since we started into the course. We can go over those settings a little bit later as well. And then another thing is branding the web portal and ensuring that access to sensitive reports is carefully controlled. Administrators also monitor and optimize performance. In the files for the course in the video description, there is a zipped folder called PE brand, 
And we're going to be using that as our branding package for the web portal. So if you want to pause and go ahead and grab that folder and place it where you've placed the other files, that would be good. So you can alter the appearance of the web portal by branding it to your business. This is done through a brand package, and I'm providing the brand package to you, that PE brand package. The brand package is designed so you don't need deep cascading style sheet CSS knowledge to create it. A brand package for reporting services consists of three items and is packaged as a zip file. It has a colors file in it, a metadata file in it, and a logo file, which can be optional. In the package I'm providing, we have all three. The metadata XML file allows you to set the name of the brand package and has a reference entry for both your colors and logo files. The files must have the names listed. You need to package the files into a zip file and the zip file can be named however you like. And there's a link on this slide for more information on branding the web portal. The other thing we'll be addressing in this lesson is security. So before you provide reports to your users, you need to give them the appropriate access within the SQL Server Reporting Services application. You use SSRS role-based security to assign Active Directory users and groups to SSRS roles for both the site and folders. Users and groups must be set up in Windows before the role assignments can be made in SSRS for the case of this course. We're doing it that way. And then reporting services installs with predefined roles that you can use to grant access to report server operations. Each predefined role describes a collection of related tasks. You can assign groups and user accounts to predefined roles to provide immediate access to report server operations. These roles are defined by the task that they support, and there are two types. There are item level roles, and they're defined on the root node and all items throughout the report server folder hierarchy. System level roles authorize access at the site level. Both types of roles are mutually exclusive, but are used together to provide comprehensive permissions to report server content and operations. There's a table in this slide deck listing the predefined roles and whether they are item or system roles. And you'll be able to see these when we start working on security. So again, the slide deck is in your files in the video description for your future reference. And I also have a link to the Microsoft Docs site where you can get more detailed information about role definitions. When you configured your report server, you set up your web service URL, right? And we accessed it by using the URL. And you set up your web portal URL as well. And so I said that I would show you these settings in the report server configuration manager. And now we're going to go to our web portal so that we can brand it. So in the files for this course that are in the video description, there are two zipped folders and they're both sample branding packages. We'll be able to see the effects of both of them. So PE brand one and four, five, six, seven branding packages are the ones that I'm referring to. Now, just a note here, if you extract these packages and then re-zip them, they're not going to work in the portal because that creates another folder inside the newly zipped folder. So it has to be a zipped folder with the three files that we discussed in it, or at minimum two files. You may not have a logo file that can be optional. So you want to make sure that you grab both of these packages from the video description. And then to brand our web portal, we're going to go back to our gear and go back to site settings. And on the left side, you're going to select branding. 
Now, you don't have to upload your brand packages to SSRS before you can access them. Like we had to upload that logo so that we can access it from within Report Builder. Here, you can just simply click on Upload Brand Package, navigate to your directory, and we'll just double click PE Brand 1. And notice the coloration of your web portal changed. There's a logo that says Practice Engine in the upper left-hand corner. And if you navigate through the site, so if I click on Practice Engine, it will take me back home and then I can get into my SSRS video course folder and the coloration, the branding is intact regardless of where you are on the site. I'm gonna go back to home and back to the gear and into site settings and then on branding. And I'm gonna remove that PE brand. And I'm gonna confirm the removal. And when you do that, it goes back to the default branding. So now let's upload brand package again. And we're gonna do the four, five, six, seven branding package this time by double clicking it. And so now you see it has different logo, different coloration. You can navigate the site and look and see what it looks like throughout the site. And then I'm gonna just keep this one for the course, but if you remove the brand package, as you saw, it will just go back to the default. So now we're gonna assign security roles to our managers and associates groups. So we're gonna go back to our gear and back to site settings. This time on the left, we're gonna go to security. And so there's a, always a built-in administrators group, right? We're gonna actually add two groups here. So go ahead and click on add group or user. And the group name has to start with your computer name. You can get this from in your report server configuration manager, just the first part of it, or in SQL Server Management Studio, just the first part of it. So I'm gonna get mine in. We had to do this in a connection string or two. And after you get that in, you're gonna type a backslash. And I named my managers group, manager space dash space sales. So that's what I'm gonna type in. And for the sales managers, I'm gonna initially assign them the role of system administrator. And you'll see how other tasks can be assigned to them as well. So system administrator, it has the description right there where they can modify system role assignments, system role definitions, system properties, and shared schedules. I want them to be able to do all of that for all of the people that work underneath them. And now we're gonna click OK. So we have our first group, we're gonna add another group, and this one is gonna be the same. We have to put it in the same way. And then the name of my second group is Associate space dash sales. And we'll assign the associates, the system user role here. And if you get the group names wrong or user names wrong, it will let you know when you click OK. So we're gonna click OK on that one. And we have our two different security roles defined so far. So to save ourselves some typing when we get to the next step in this process, let's edit our manager sales group and then see if you can copy the path that we had to type in up at the top. 
so we won't have to type that again. And then I'm going to just cancel out of there. And now we're ready to go to our next step. So we're going to go back home and then we're going to go into manage folder. And when we go into manage folder, it only has a security tab. Here, we're going to click on add group or user. And in the group or user name box, we're going to paste in what we copied. And now we have one or more roles to assign to this group. So, and again, these are listed in the slide deck, but here on the screen, it has definitions of what these roles can do and they're check boxes. So you can assign multiple roles to a group or a user. So in addition to their system administrator role, we're going to give them the role of content manager. So they can manage content in the report server, including folders, reports, and resources. And now we're going to click okay at the bottom. We're going to add another group or user. And now if you want to, you can go back to site settings, security, and copy the associates, but I'm going to just go ahead and type in the group again here. Figure by the time I navigate there and copy it, I can just type it in. And for our sales associates, we're going to give them browser, the browser role. And we're going to click OK. So now we have our security roles defined both at in the site settings level and in the folder level. We're going to take it down one more level. Let's go back to home and get into your SSRS video course folder. Hover over your drill down report, go to the more info ellipsis and select manage. And on the left side, go to security. So we see here that we have our, it's carrying over at the report level. We have our sales associates here with browser capability just like we gave them at the root and our sales managers have content manager capability, which we also gave them at the root. But for this particular report, we want the sales associates to have a different capability. So I'm going to go ahead and click on customize security. And so it's going to confirm that I want to do this. It says item security is inherited from a parent item, meaning the root of our portal. Do you want to apply security settings for this item that are different from those of the SSRS video course parent item? And we're going to say, okay. So now we have edit buttons in front of our roles and I'm going to edit the associate sales, the sales associates, and they can continue to keep their browser role. But for this one, we're going to give them also a publisher role and apply. And then we can go back to home. There are several tools that can be used for you to monitor the performance of reporting services. You would want to evaluate your server activity watch trends, diagnose system bottlenecks, and gather data that can help you determine whether the current system configuration is sufficient. Microsoft Windows Server Operating System provides performance information through these four tools, Task Manager, Event Viewer, Performance Monitor, and then Process Monitor is a separate download. There's a link to the download for process monitor in the software requirements Word document. So we've all used Task Manager. It provides information about programs and processes running on your computer. You can use Task Manager to monitor key indicators of your report server's performance. You can also assess the activity of running processes 
and view graphs and data on CPU and memory usage. You can use Event Viewer and Performance Monitor to create logs and alerts about report processing and resource consumption. If you leave a configuration item in your report server but don't fully set it up, then reporting services will report an error when it attempts to load it. To prevent this, you can comment out the section in a specific config file, and you'll see how that works, the ones that are not being used so you don't keep getting those errors generated. I have two links on this slide for you. So you have the link about an errors and events reference for reporting services and performance monitor on this slide. So we're gonna start by taking a tour in Task Manager. I'm gonna just go to the search box and type it and open it up. So in Task Manager, if I scroll down under Background Processes, I'll run into my Reporting Services service. We have RS Management, RS Portal. If you expand RS Service, you'll see your SQL Server reporting services. Now here, the Reporting Services service, that must be running for any and all SQL report server functionality. You also have your performance tab at the top, which you're probably already used to. And then I'm gonna go to the services tab and it's just a listing of the services. And on details, I can scroll and see more detailed information. Here's my reporting services service and it is in fact running or we wouldn't have been very successful in this class. Another way of tracking your performance is using Event Viewer, and I'm gonna just type that, start typing that in the search box to open it up. Now in Event Viewer, I've created a custom view for my report server, and you can set a custom view, create a custom view on the right-hand side. And I don't believe there's a limit to how many you could have. So I'm gonna just pull this down. I have a whole bunch of errors in here. And a lot of them I didn't address because I wanted to be able to show you them from the class and how you can resolve at least some of them. So if I click on my first error, right? And I look at the bottom of the screen, there's a details tab, there's a general and then a details tab. And it gives me a error because this hasn't been set up yet. A lot of times if you have things that haven't been fully set up, you'll get an error here and that you can see an event viewer. Now the second error is a common error here. Event 108 is what it's called. And if I look at the details, this one says DAX. If I find another event 108 in the list and I look at the details, this one says SQL PDW. So these event 108 errors are for things that you do not need to use in your applications, but they try to load all the time. So we can resolve those and I'll show you how it's done. We're gonna be using a rsreportserver.config file to resolve those errors by commenting out the extensions that we're not using. So we're gonna go ahead and do that now. But again, what I would suggest to you in Event Viewer is set up custom views so that you can quickly not have to look through like a huge long list of a mix of every kind of error that there is for every kind of source. So now I'm gonna show you how to get to the path where you can open the config file that we're gonna modify. So the path that you want to navigate to on your system is showing in my address bar so navigate to that particular folder. And in that folder, 
you will find the rsreportserver.config file. And when you find it, you can go ahead and double click it to open it. It will open it in Visual Studio. So you could search for extension in here, but I'm going to narrow the search. So I'm going to do control F and I am going to type the words for V because I know there's a commented line above the section where the extensions that I have those 108 errors for reside. So it selected my search results. I can close the find box now. And in this group here are the ones that I get error 108s for. Not all of them, but some of them. So the ones that I need to get rid of or comment out rather, I'm not going to get rid of them. I'm going to comment them out. They're listed in this section, but I have to comment them out in the following section where they're listed like individually with their configuration and information underneath them. So I'm going to do a pointer and show you what I'm going to do on my screen. And this may be different for you if you go and look and see what kind of 108 sources are in your event viewer. You can come back in here and comment out those extensions as well. So I'm working in this general area here. So I get 108 errors for SQL PDW, Oracle, and Teradata. And I also get one for DAX, but DAX is not in this list. So what I'm going to do is, and I don't need to use any of these in my reporting services. So I'm going to comment out those blocks in here. So in XML, the begin comment is a less than exclamation point dash dash. And you'll get some help in here when we get ready to start typing it. So I put my mouse right in front of the first extension that I want to comment out. And that's the SQL PDW one. And in my case, the three that I'm going to comment out are right grouped together. So that's where I'm going to start. I have my insertion point there. I'm going to press enter and up arrow to get to the line above it. And I'm going to type the less than symbol. And as soon as I do that, the list pops up and it gives me the exclamation point and the two dashes. And I can select it from the list. When you select it from the list, it also gives you the end commenting out symbol which is dash dash greater than. I'm going to just delete that dash dash greater than. And now I get the wavy red underline because it's waiting for its mate. So I'm going to go down to the extension name Teradata and I'm going to click at the end of its configuration line. And I'll point this out a little bit more graphically for you where I am now. I'm going to put my insertion point there. I'm going to press enter and on the blank line, I'm going to then type in the end comment symbol, which is dash dash greater than. So you'll notice the wavy red underlines gone. So I'm, and this, all of the text in between the commenting out symbols has turned green. So when everything loads, these things will not attempt to load. And therefore I won't get those error 8108s for these three items. And I'm going to go ahead and save this file. And I'm going to close it using the tab. 
The next tool we're going to access is Performance Monitor. So I'm going to go to my search box and I'm going to type CMD and open the command prompt app. And I'm going to just type perf mon and press enter. So Performance Monitor opens. And let's start on the left side of the screen. Under Monitoring Tools, let's click on Performance Monitor. And you'll see your graph will start populating. Now at the top, you're looking at the current activity, these little icons at the top. We're looking at current activity. Or you could view the log data. You could change the graph type from here. Let's click on view log data for a moment. So in here, if you click on log files and add, it takes you directly to the folder that you need to be in. Let me go up one level. Sometimes it'll take you here and you have to go into the server manager folder where the log files are kept. And then you could select a log file. I'm going to just cancel out of that. If I go to the data tab, I got to change it back to current activity. If I go to the data tab, it's just giving me processor information. You can change the color. The graph, you can also change the graph here. So you have line, histogram bar. And if I apply, you'll see that. You have report. If I apply that, it just shows this. And it's capturing the percent. And I'm going to just go back to line here and apply that. And then you have your appearance tab where you can change to give the graph of the graph a background borders, so on and so forth. I'm going to just cancel out of there. You also have two other folders here, data collection sets and reports. And again, on the slide there's detailed information on other things that you can do in performance monitor. Now, if I go back, to performance at the top on the left, I can open the resource monitor by using this link. So this opens, there's an overview screen, CPU, memory, disk, network. And on the network screen, I can see my reporting service, hosting service. And I can close this window and performance monitor is still open. So now we can go ahead and close out our performance monitor. So if you've downloaded process monitor, you can access it from your search box by just typing proc mon or starting to type it. And the executable will open up the screen for you. So this is quite intense looking at it like this, right? You do have the ability to filter in here. I'm seeing my RS hosting service here, right? So you can filter for certain things and basically it's letting you know the time of day, the process name, all of this information, detail, results, so on and so forth for all of these processes. So you can use this as another method of monitoring the performance of your processes. So you can play around in here. And also from the link where you downloaded it, there's a great wealth of information on how to navigate this for whatever it is that you're going to need to do. You have these buttons over here where you can just show registry activity, file system activity, network, process and thread activity, profiling events, stuff like that. So it's applying the filter. When I click that, I said show registry activity. It's another way of applying a filter in here. And I'm going to go ahead and close process monitor. So when it comes to administering reporting services, we went in and branded the web portal. We tried out two different brand packages 
and just to change the color scheme. And both of the brand packages included a logo. So we got to see how that worked. And that you don't need to upload the brand package to SSRS before being able to access it. After that, we went into security and we set up our user groups, our two user groups with a default security level. And then we went and applied other tasks to them. So we have our security set up. These are the things that they are able to do in SSRS. After that, we looked at four different tools to monitor reporting services performance. We started with Task Manager, and we looked at the reporting services service process in particular. That's the one that has to be running for any and all SQL report server functionality. We then went into Event Viewer, and I showed you my custom folder and so my custom folder just dealt with SSRS. So it's a way of filtering. So I don't have to look through a whole long list of errors and notifications. And we specifically talked about error ID 108 and a way to resolve it by modifying the RS report server config file, which we did. We then moved on to performance monitor, where we can not only see the performance being monitored graphically, but it also contains a resource monitor. And lastly, we access process monitor. And it can be overwhelming when you first go in there, unless you use the event filters on the toolbar or create your own filter from the toolbar. Thank you for attending the SSRS video course. In conclusion, what did we cover? We began summarizing report data. And we did that by sorting data and then creating report subreports and nested data regions. We also covered drill down actions and creating drill through reports. Module seven, we got into sharing reporting services reports by creating schedules. You learned about report caching, snapshots, and comments. And then we got into report subscription and delivery. The eighth module saw us administering reporting services. This included branding the web portal and ensuring that access to sensitive reports is carefully controlled. So we started working with security. And then we got into reporting services performance and how to monitor it. And we use four different ways of monitoring it. Hi everyone, I'm Trish Connor Cato. Welcome to Analyzing Data with SQL Server Reporting Services, also referred to as SSRS. This video course is for those who will be the administrators of SSRS and who need to create dynamic paginated reports using the reporting tools. You'll also learn the SSRS administrative tasks during the course. When we begin the course, there is a Word document in the video description that I will review with you before we get started into the course. In this Word document, you'll find all the requirements, software requirements necessary to get your system ready for this course, as well as the links and instructions to download and configure software as necessary. Module nine is geared toward extending and integrating reporting services. You'll learn how to extend the functionality of reporting services with expressions and custom code. You'll also learn the methods for working with reporting services programmatically. Modules 10 and 11 both cover mobile reports. Module 10 introduces the design and publication of reports that are intended for consumption on mobile devices. SSRS includes support for mobile reports, although the tools that are used to design and publish them are different than the tools used for paginated reports. 
And in module 11, you'll learn about the element types that you can add to mobile reports, and you will design, publish, and learn how to access them. Although reporting services is a powerful tool, its built-in capabilities might not always meet your needs. This module covers the methods for extending the functionality of reporting services with expressions and custom code. You will also learn about the methods for working with reporting services programmatically by creating custom assemblies using Visual Basic code. You don't need to know Visual Basic as I will walk you through two separate short code blocks. So in this module, we have two lessons. The first lesson is about expressions and embedded code. And the second lesson will get into custom assemblies. So we've already used expressions during this course and we'll use expressions in this section as well. In paginated reports, expressions are used throughout the report definition to specify or calculate values for a whole host of items from parameters to bookmarks. There is a link to more expression uses in paginated reports there for you. In addition to expressions, SSRS allows us to add embedded customized code to a report in order to perform functions that may not be available or easily implemented in SSRS. The code which is embedded must be Visual Basic and allows for code reuse, which in turn may simplify report updates. So embedded code is created on the code tab of the report properties dialog box, and then referenced in an expression for the report object being impacted by the code. Embedded code can also be created in a class library, which enables it to be copied and pasted into any report. And in addition, you can save a report that has embedded code in it as a template, which you'll see in this lesson. We're going to get started by creating an expression in our drill through target report and report builder. Let's start by running this report. So if we look through the prices, what we want to set up is an expression that if the price is less than or equal to 100, we want the color of it to be red. If not, we want it to be green. So let's go back to design view and get this set up. We're going to right click the sum, the unit price field in the detail row. And we're going to go to text box properties. On the left side, we're going to go to font. Next to font color, next to color, we're going to click the function button. And notice it just has in there, it doesn't even have an equal sign, it just has the color. We're going to double click that and delete it. And we're going to type an equal sign in the set expression box. Now we're going to use the immediate if function here. So it's IIF is the name of the function. And then we need an open parenthesis. Now go ahead in the category pane and expand fields stock items so that our values list populates with the fields and it'll save us on some of this typing. We're going to select unit price and then we're going to type a less than equal to symbol and 100. So if that is true, type a comma and in double quotes, type red. If that is false, type a comma, and in double quotes, type green. And then type your closing paren. So if the unit price value is less than or equal to 100, the font will be red. If not, the font will be green. Go ahead and click OK and OK. 
Now let's run the report again. So I see my unit prices that are less than $100 are showing in red, and the other less than or equal to 100 are showing in red, and the rest are showing in green. Pretty cool expression. Let's go back to design view and save. Now we're going to create another expression and we're going to place it in the page footer for this report. And we're going to be making it a concatenated expression. We want it to say page one of five, for example. So the actual page number and then the total number of pages. And we're going to use some globals fields. These are not like when we went into fields before in the expression box, we use the data set fields. So globals fields are fields that can be used on any report, regardless of the data set. I'll just describe it that way. And so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to right click and add page footer. And then we're going to right click in the page footer and insert a text box. I'm going to move the text box to the upper left corner of that footer section and expand it. And then we're going to type equals an equal sign and then an open double quote and the word page. Type a space and then a closing double quote. After we get it all in, I'll go over it. Another space and the ampersand for concatenation. And then you're going to type the word globals, plural, an exclamation point, page number. So there is a global field named page number, and it's all mushed together. Another space and an ampersand and a space. Open double quotes space of, and we're going to do another space after of, close the double quote, an ampersand, and then we're going to type globals exclamation point again, and this time we're going to use the total pages field. So it's going to actually say the word page is in double quotes. That's literal text. So it's going to say page one of five, something like that, depending on the pages. And we can click on the edge of the text box. And now you'll see it just says expression in there or the abbreviation for expression. And we're going to make it bold and 12 point font. Let's run this and take a look at it. And we're going to navigate to the last page and scroll down. And so at the bottom, you'll see page three of three based on that concatenated expression using two globals fields. And we can go back to design view and save. We're going to get started with embedded code in Visual Studio. And I already have our sales information VS project open. We're going to start with a small sample of Visual Basic code that will just display a simple message to the user. So what we're going to do is we're going to right click on the reports folder in Solution Explorer, hover over add and choose new item. We're going to name this report embedded code. Now we're going to right click in a blank area and go to report properties. And in report properties on the left hand side, we're going to click on code. In the custom code box, you're going to type function, the word function space greeting and open and closing parentheses space as space string. Now, when you're typing visual basic code in report properties code window, it's not like you're going to have a code editor available. 
So you have to kind of really know the structure and syntax of your code in order to do it this way. We're going to press enter and then tab and we're going to type return space and then double quotes. Hope you are having a wonderful day. Exclamation point, close the quotes, enter, and we're going to type end function. So we're creating a function procedure, which we're naming greeting and its return is going to be a string. So text, and then we tell it what to return that text. Hope you're having a wonderful day. And then we have to have the end function statement or it won't work. Every function has to be enclosed between function and end function. So go ahead and click OK. So we put that code in report properties in order to reference it in the report. We're going to right click on the report canvas and insert a text box. And you can move the text box to the upper left and expand its width. You're going to right click inside the text box and you're going to go to expression. So we have our expression window. And this is where we need to reference the embedded code. So after your equal sign, you're going to type the word code and the dot. So it's letting it know to look for embedded code. And we have to give it the name of the function, which we called greeting. So you're going to just type code dot greeting. And then you're going to, and it's typical to see red underlines in here because it's not a code editor and we're going to click okay. So now the text box just says expression. Let's go ahead and preview the report. So just a simple message to the user. Hope you're having a wonderful day. We created the code, the function procedure in report properties code page. And then we reference the code in a text box expression. We can go back to design view. It suggested that if you're going to write longer, more complicated blocks of code, or if you're not used to visual basic code language, that you create a class library project. A class library contains a code editor, so it will help you build your code blocks. And that's what we're going to do now. So we're gonna leave this open, let's just save. And I'm gonna go to my search box and type Visual Studio. And I'm going to launch another instance of Visual Studio. When it launches on the bottom right, we're going to continue without code. And then we're going to go up to File, hover over New, and choose Project. So when we started, we created a report server project. That's what we've been working in this whole time. Now we're going to create a class library project. So in your search box, you can search for class library and you get several results. Always be aware if there's a scroll bar on the right, All right? So we're looking for one that is suitable for visual basic and there are a few of them that do include visual basic. So for example, the first one on my list does not have visual basic underneath it. It's for C sharp. And actually, if you look at the icon, it has C sharp on it. The second one has visual basic and it has VB on the icon. We want to scroll down until we see class library and then in parentheses .NET framework after it. And we're looking for the one that has VB on the icon. 
So once you find it, click on it and then choose next. We're going to name it custom code VB. That's what we're going to name this project. And we're going to click create. When it launches, it opens up a class one dot VB tab that is a code editor window. And that's where we're going to put our block of code. So the first thing I'm going to do in here is I want my font to be larger. So I'm going to go up to the tools tab on the menu bar, and I'm going to go all the way to the bottom to options. And in there, I'm going to do fonts and colors on the left side under environment. And I'm going to change my font size to 14 in here and click OK. I'm going to click on the line. So it creates a class. OK, and it names it class one by default. And you'll learn more about that a little bit later. But my insertion point is under that public class, class one line, and I want to press enter one more time. For me personally, when I'm coding, I like to have a blank line between the name of the thing, the framework, and conversely, when we get to the end of the code line, I'd like to have a blank line before end class. So we're going to create a function procedure. And after we get it typed in, I'll explain it to you. So we're going to type the word function. And because this is a code editor, it shows up on the list. I can stop typing and press tab to get that word in there. And then I'm going to type a space and I'm going to give it a name. And the name is going to be long date format. And then we have to give it parameters. So I'm going to type an open parenthesis and it's going to give me the closing one and put the insertion point between the two of them. And in there, I'm going to type any date as the as keyword and then date. And that also comes up on the list. So this function, the long date format, any date that we apply this function to will be formatted as a date. And then at the end of it, we're going to give it another declaration by using the as keyword again. And notice when we get to the end of it, there's only two things you can use outside of it. Two keywords as or handles. We're going to do as again and then string. Press enter. Notice how it indents you. When we did this in report properties code window, I had us press tab after we typed the function line to get the indentation. We're going to type dim and then suffix as string and use the list as much as you can. Again, I'll go over this when we get done. Press enter type twice. Now we're going to type select and then space case space day and then in parentheses any day any date. After the parentheses press enter and it gives you another indentation and it gives you the case keyword again. We're going to type one comma 21 comma 31 enter suffix equals and then in double quotes S T at the end of that line, press enter. And you're going to do shift tab here. So you're at the same margin as that case 12131 statement. We're going to type case space two comma space 22 enter 
suffix equals, and then double quotes, ND at the end of that line, enter and shift tab. We're going to type case again, or select it from the list. Three comma 23, enter, suffix equals double quote RD. Enter at the end of the line and shift tab one more time. And we're going to do case and then the else keyword, enter, suffix equals and double quotes TH. Press enter at the end of that line, and it gave us our in select statement. Actually, we don't need to do an enter there. We can just delete and then shift tab to get that in select to the same margin as select case. So when we did select case, it gave us the in select. Like when we came in here, right? When we did function, if you look, it also gave us end function. So the code editor really helps you out in building your code. After your in select statement, you're going to press enter twice, and then you're going to type return space format, open paren, any date, comma, double quote. And notice it gives you the closing double quote. You're going to type four small letter D's space, and then a single small letter D, and then come outside of the parentheses, type an ampersand, and then suffix, space, ampersand, and then format, in parentheses, any date, comma, and a space. And this time we're going to do a set of double quotes and we're going to type a space, four capital letter M's, a space, and then four small letter Y's. And honestly, the casing in here doesn't matter. So you didn't have to do capital M's. It won't hurt anything. So. Now come outside of that closing parenthesis and press enter. And then go to the end of the end function statement and press another enter. Okay, so we have our code in here. Let's go ahead and save. And let me break down what's going on here. Okay, let's review this function. So we named it long date format. We gave it a parameter as any date, and we gave that a data type of date. And then the long date format itself is in a string data type. We declared a variable using the dim statement. We named it suffix, and we assigned it the string data type. Then we did a select case construct. Select case is similar to if, then, else, if, end, if code. So it does multiple checks. And if the check is valid, it will apply the condition. So in this case, it's really saying we're putting the case statement on the day of any date the day portion of the date. Case 1, 21, and 31, we want to give it a suffix of ST. So if it's the 1st or the 21st or the 31st, that ends in ST. If it's 2 or 22, it ends in ND. 3 and 23 ends in RD. And if none of those are true, whatever else it is would end in TH. And then we end that select case construct. Then we tell it what the function is going to return. It's going to return a format. So any date, we want it to have a format of 
giving the full day of the week. That's the four letter D's. The full name of the day of the week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. And after that, we want it to have the number of the date. So the number of the day. So Wednesday, the first, for example, right? So the number of the day. Now, if we did the 1D, so the first through the ninth would only be one number. If we did two Ds for that second one, it would pre-zero the single digit. So zero one, zero two, all the way up to zero nine. But we're doing one D. We don't want the pre-zeroed on the single digit days. After that single digit or after the digit of the day of the month, it's going to apply the suffix depending on what that number is which we outlined in the select case statement. So if it's a one, if it's the first of the month, it's going to apply the ST suffix. If it's the 23rd of the month, it's going to apply the RD suffix. If it's the fourth day of the month, it will apply the TH, which we captured in case else statement. And then the ampersand is the concatenation. So it's combining all of these things. And then we're going to concatenate another format. And that format is going to be for the full month, the four letter M's. And again, they don't have to be capitalized. And then the full year. If we did two M's there, we would get an abbreviated month. If we did two Y's there, we would get the last two digits of the year. And then we end our function. Now our function is contained in this class known as class one. Go ahead and save if you haven't. We'll be doing more work in our class library later, but for right now, what I'd like you to do is copy the code that we have here we're not copying public class, class one, or in class, just from function to end function. We're going to select it and then copy that code. And then switch back over to your other instance of Visual Studio where we have that embedded code report set up. We're going to right click in a blank area and go to report properties and go to the code tab on the left. And let's select our code that we typed in earlier, just delete it, and then paste in that function that we just created in our class library project. Now notice how it comes in, all of the keywords are in blue. It's pasting in the result of it being created in a code editor window. Watch this, click okay, and then right click again and go back to report properties, go back to code, and it dropped that code editor format. So it only shows when you paste it in there, but this is not a code editor, so it can't retain it. And we can click okay again. Now we're gonna use the same text box that we created before. We're just gonna right click inside of it and go to expression. And you can get rid of that expression. You can keep the equal sign, the code.greeting expression. So now what we're going to do is we're going to do equal, if you got rid of it, type equal, code.longdateformat, because that's what we named the function. And then we have to pass it the argument for what date to use. And so that's where, after we did function long date format and parentheses, we said any date as date. Now we have to tell it which date to apply this to. So we're gonna do an open parenthesis. And in the category pane, we're gonna double click built-in fields. That's where your globals fields reside. 
and we're going to double click execution time. So it puts that up there in the appropriate syntax. And all we have to do is type the closing parenthesis. So we're saying apply that long date format that we created through a function procedure to the execution time field and click OK. So now if you go and preview it in our function code, we told it to give us the full day of the week, right? That was the four letter D's. Give us the day of the month. Depending on the day of the month, put the appropriate suffix behind it. Give us the full name of the month and the full year. And we can go back to design view. So now I'm going to show you how to save code as a template. It's actually saving the report that contains the code as a template. So we're going to just de delete this text box here that's referencing the code because the code is stored again in report properties on the code window. So the, the code is stored in the report definition. Let's save. And I'm going to use the X to close the embedded code report. So now we have to use Windows Explorer to navigate to the directory where the reports are being saved to on your system. So I have my window open and this is where you need to navigate to because remember all our VS stuff is in that source repos folder. So navigate to that folder and you'll see all of your reports in there as well as their RDL files. So we're going to right click on embedded code report and copy it. The next place you need to navigate to is this path at the top that's highlighted and I expanded it so you could see the full path. So you need to navigate to that path and that is where templates are stored. When you get there, we're going to paste the embedded code report that we did and we're going to rename it long date format. So notice in here you have data set, data source, report. When we right click on the report folder and we hover over add and we choose new item, that's the things that we're seeing in that screen. That's where the templates are held for Visual Studio. So now I'm going to go back to Visual Studio. So I've gotten into this habit whenever I save a template. When I come back over to Visual Studio, I close and relaunch it. And the reason why is a lot of times the template won't show up in the correct way. It is a known glitch, but so we're going to close this instance, our sales information VS project of Visual Studio, and then just relaunch the application and reopen the project from the opening screen. When it's open now, we're going to right click on our reports folder in Solution Explorer, hover over add, choose new item, and you will see your long date format. Now, if we hadn't closed Visual Studio and relaunched it, the icon that indicates a report wouldn't be there. It's just a blank and that means it's not going to work. So I don't know why that is happening, but now I'm just in the habit of doing this. So we're going to actually use this template. So click on your template and we'll name this report order information and then add. Now that we created the template, right? We really don't need the embedded code report. So I'm going to right click on embedded code in the solution explorer and I'm going to delete it. 
Okay, so now we're gonna actually build a table report here and we'll reference our function, our long date format function. The code is already here. We can check and see if you right click in a blank area, go to report properties, go to the code window, the code is in there because it was in the template. So let's insert a table here. We're gonna name our data set code example, and we're gonna use our shared data set and click okay. And let's drag the table. You know what to do here and widen it. And in report data pane, expand your data set. And we're gonna right click and view our grouping pane. So we're gonna drag order date from our data set down to the grouping pane and drop it above details in row groups. We're gonna drag order ID underneath order date in row groups. And then into the table, we're gonna drag quantity and transaction amount. Now we're going to do an expression that references our code, our long date format code. So we're gonna right click order date in the table, the detail row, and we're gonna to go to expression. And after the equal sign, you're gonna leave that fields order date value there. After the equal sign here, you're gonna type code dot long date format, and then enclose the fields in parentheses. And we're gonna click okay. Now we're gonna right click the order date expression And we're gonna hover over add total and choose after. And we're gonna add the word grand in front of total. Then we're gonna right click the order ID in the detail cell, add total after, and we're gonna put the word daily in front of that total. I'm gonna format all three of my transaction amounts as currency. So by right-clicking text box property, we've done this before. So you have to do it for each one. So they are all the same way. Let's make daily total bold. And we're gonna format the grand total row with a blue background of your choice, white 12 point bold font. So blue background of your choice. Make the font white, 12 point, and bold. And I'm gonna do the same formatting on a header row. Let's add a page header section and insert a text box into it. And we are going to move that text box accordingly and widen it. And we're gonna right click in the text box. You get it in there right. And we're gonna go to expression. 
So we already have our equal sign here. We're going to just do it in the expression and we're going to do code dot long date format. And then an open parenthesis, we're going to double click our built in fields and we're going to choose execution time again and close the parenthesis and now click OK. We can get rid of that extra white space, not necessary. I'm going to get rid of the extra white space underneath the report as well. Go ahead and preview your report. Because that code was built into the report definition in the template, we're able to just reference it as many times as we want in the report to apply it to various date fields via expressions like we did in the text box or attaching it to that order date field like we did. If we had more date fields that we wanted formatted that way, we could do the same thing. So you can see how you can reuse code easily. We didn't have to go back over to the class library and copy the code and paste it into the report definition. We saved the embedded code report as a template. You can go back to design view and save. Our second lesson here is extending reporting services by creating custom assemblies. So this is another way of including custom coding your reports and it's created using the Microsoft.net framework that you can reference from within your report definition files. The way it works is the server calls the functions in your custom assemblies when a report is run. Custom assemblies can be used to retrieve specialized functions that you plan to use in multiple reports. It's basically a custom function library that is available to every new report project created. Custom assemblies allow for consistent code reuse and simplified maintenance of standard code across multiple reports and projects. Once the steps are completed, the DLL dynamic link library file must be deployed to the report server bin directory, along with the windows assembly directory on the reports. Finally, in the report itself, a reference must be added for the assembly. And then at last, the assembly functions can be used and referenced within the report. Unlike embedded code in SSRS, custom assembly code can be written in Visual Basic, C Sharp, C++, and others. We're going to be working in our class library project that we created in a separate instance of Visual Studio. And what we're going to do here is we're going to modify our function to start with so that it is available in a lot of different instances. So what we're going to do is we're going to click in front of the word function and we're going to type the keyword public space and then the keyword shared. The public keyword makes it available outside of the class module that it's created in. Now notice when we started in here, when we first created this project, it made the class public by default. So the class itself is already public. We're making the function public as well. And then a shared keyword means you can access it without referencing the class. So this is setting it up to be able to be utilized in a custom assembly. Now let's say you're going to have lots of custom code and some of it you want in visual basic and others you might want in I'll say C sharp, for example. So you would have two choices here, right? If you wanted to create code in C sharp, you'd have to use a new class library that supports that language. The one that we chose supports Visual Basic. You could create another project or you could create another project within this one for your C sharp code. So that way you could have one class library with two different projects that support two different languages all in the same solution file, if you will.
So I'm going to show you how you would set that up. We'll go with the choice where you're going to create a new project within this one. So we're going to right click on the top of solution Explorer, right click on solution custom code VB. We're going to hover over add and we're going to choose new project. So we already searched for class library. So I'm going to go back to the search for class library. And so the last time we chose the class library.net framework for visual basic right above it in my list is the class library net.net framework for C sharp. Let's select that one and choose next. And we're going to call this project custom code C sharp. And it won't let us put the sharp in. So we're going to spell it out. Yeah, there's all those characters that you can't use in names here. And we're going to go ahead and click create. So now you have two different projects within the same solution. You have your custom code C sharp and notice it's on the class one dot CS for C sharp here, right? We could have done CS there in the name. And then you still have your tab open for class one for visual basic. If we wanted to rename, the project from custom code C sharp to custom code CS, we could right click on it in solution Explorer and go to rename. And we could make that change there. We can also collapse that if we're not using it. So imagine you had multiple languages, you could have a different project for each of them in the same solution. So all of your custom code is in the same space. We're not going to be using C sharp. So what we're going to do is we're going to right click on custom code CS. And this time we're going to remove it. And you're going to say, okay. The other thing I typically do in a class library is I rename my classes. So in Solution Explorer, you can expand VB class one dot VB. Then you have your class one and we're going to rename our class. We're going to right click on class one VB and go to rename. And we're going to name this functions date and press enter. So you're renaming a file. Would you also like to perform a rename in this project of all references to the code element class one? Yes, I do. So I don't have to do it manually. So now if you look, it says public class functions date instead of class one dot VB, we also have that functions date up here. I would do a naming convention like that with the common word first. So if I were going to have text functions, right, I would have another class and call it functions text. So I can continue to add more date functions in this functions date class. And then if I had text functions or other functions, I can have them separate in all of their classes as well. And that would look like this. We're going to right click on custom code VB. hover over add and we're going to choose class. So we're going to name this class functions text and add it. So now you can see we have our two classes there appropriately named. Conversely, delete a class, just right click on functions text and choose delete. 
And now we'd like to save. And actually, let's close our functions date tab. And then we can save all. The next thing we have to do is generate a DLL, which can be referenced in our report server project. So in Solution Explorer, we're going to right click on custom code VB. And to generate a DLL, we have to build the project. So go ahead and click on build on the list. You get an output window at the bottom and it lets me know that my build succeeded. I'm going to go ahead and close that output window. Now we're going to find the DLL. So we're going to right click on our custom code VB again. And this time we're going to go down to properties. On the left side of properties, we're going to click on compile. And you'll see your build output path. So it's putting it in the bin file and then there's a debug folder. The good news is we don't have to navigate through Windows Explorer to be able to get to this file folder. So what we're going to do here is we can go ahead and close this custom code VB properties tab. We're going to right click on custom code VB again. And then we're going to say open folder in file explorer. In my version, it's the third one from the bottom. So we have to just double click the bin folder and then the debug folder. And then we'll see our DLL, our dynamic link library file. We need to copy that file and we're going to end up pasting it in two different locations. The first location we're going to paste the DLL file into is the one for debugging and testing in report designer. And so you can follow the path that I have in my address bar to get to the private assemblies folder. And then you're going to paste our DLL in there. And so I can see it's already in there. And now we have a second location that we're going to paste to. And I will bring up that path for you as well. So you can follow the path here in this address bar. And when you get into the bin folder for the report server, we're going to paste it into there. So that is the setup for a custom assembly. And now we're going to get ready to test it. We are going to test our custom assembly in our sales information VS solution. So our other instance of Visual Studio. And what we're going to do is we're going to just add a new report. So I'm going to right click on the reports folder, hover over add, choose new item. We're going to use the default report template and we're going to name this report custom assemblies. We're going to right click in a blank area and go to report properties. And on the left this time, we're going to go to references. And this is where you can add or remove assemblies and or classes. We're going to choose add. And then we're going to click on the ellipsis button to the right. Sometimes it takes a while to load the .NET references here. Once they're loaded, we're going to go to the browse tab. And notice for me, it's still in the private assemblies folder. So if you're not in the private assemblies folder, you can use the drop down to navigate your way there. And so you can see it's C all the way down to private assemblies if you need to get your way there. And once you're there, you should be able to see your custom code VB DLL in the list and double click it. Now let's say we also had a C sharp library 
in our other solution, in the class library solution. We could add an assembly for that here as well. So if you need to reference more than one assembly at a time, you can. And we are going to click OK at the bottom. We're going to add a text box, insert a text box for our report. I'm going to just make it a little bit wider. And we're going to right click in it and choose expression. Now, when you're doing an expression for a custom assembly, you have to use what's called a fully qualified reference. It includes the namespace, also known as the project name. And then you're going to have to use the dot notation and have the class name minus the dot VB on it. And then another dot notation and the name of your function. So what I'm going to do, and you don't have to do this, I'm going to just switch back over to the class library. So that means our project is custom code VB. Our class is functions date. We don't need the dot VB there. And then if I expand that folder, my function is long date format and we have to pass a date to it as an argument. So we're going to make reference to this assembly now. So after equals, you're going to type custom code VB and then a dot notation. Functions, plural, date, dot, long date format, and then an open parenthesis. So we have to give it a date as an argument. We'll use another built-in field. So double click built-in fields and just choose execution time and then scroll to the right and do a closing parenthesis. Click okay and go ahead and preview your report. So now you are getting the long date format via a public shared custom assembly that can be referenced using a fully qualified reference in any report that you choose to use it in. So you learned that you could also save a report that has embedded code in it as a template, and that's great you know, but this gives you more flexibility because you can have an enormous amount of custom assemblies that can be accessed from the references tab. Let's go ahead and go back to design view. We're going to save and close our custom assemblies report. And we're going to redeploy this solution. So I'm going to right click on solution and deploy solution. In module nine, we covered extending reporting services by utilizing expressions and embedded code and expressions that reference embedded code and then extending reporting services with custom assemblies. So we had been using expressions throughout the course, but then we got to do embedded code. We did simple visual basic code. And again, embedded code has to be in visual basic code. And we were able to see that we were also able to save a report with embedded code as a template so that you can reuse it over and over again and just have to create an expression to reference the embedded code. We moved on to modifying our visual basic code so that it was public and shared and which in effect turned it into a custom assembly. Once we did that, we had to locate the DLL file and copy it to two locations. And we were able to test our custom assembly and learn that in a class library project, you can have multiple 
projects within the same project. So you could have a Visual Basic project, you can have a C Sharp project, so on and so forth. And when you add the custom assemblies into report properties, you can add multiple assemblies at the same time using different languages. And then you actually can just call the assemblies by using a fully qualified reference in an expression and making sure to pass any required arguments to it. Custom assemblies actually give you more flexibility than saving embedded code in a report template because you can use existing reports and go ahead and add the custom assemblies to it and use those functions in them as well. Before we get into our next module, I want to spend a few moments just cleaning up a little bit in SSRS. The first thing I have to do is swap out this brand package. I can't take it a moment longer. So I'm going to go to the gear and go to site settings, branding, and I'm going to remove that brand package and confirm the removal. And I'll just leave it on the default one. And then I'm going to go back home to the home page. Now, this is where it's been putting everything that we've been recently deploying out of Visual Studio. So if I click on this sales information folder, it has all of the reports on it. So let's go back to home, go back into SSRS video course folder, and I'm going to delete this data sources folder VS. I'm also going to delete data sets VS. And I'm going to delete sales information VS because when I look in it, it only has three of the reports. So I'm going to delete that as well. And then I'm going to go back home and I'm going to move data sources into SSRS video course folder. Do the same with data sets. and with sales information VS. So now we have all of our stuff in all organized for our course. Before we begin module 10, I just want to point out that this is where you will need to have the SQL Server mobile report publisher installed. And that link to download it is in the software requirements Word document in the video description. You may also want to download the Power BI mobile app onto your mobile device, as that's the vehicle you'll use on your mobile devices to access your mobile reports. This module introduces the design and publication of reports that are intended for consumption on mobile devices, such as smartphones or tablets. SSRS includes support for mobile reports, although, as you now know, the tools that are used to design and publish mobile reports are different than the tools used for paginated reports discussed in the earlier modules of this course. So modules 10 and our last module, module 11, both are dealing with mobile reports. In this module, we're going to do an overview of mobile reports in the first lesson. The second lesson is all about how to prepare your data for mobile reports. And in the third lesson, you'll get an overview of the mobile report publisher. With the mobile report publisher, you can quickly create reporting services mobile reports optimize for mobile devices and a variety of other form factors. Mobile reports feature an assortment of visualizations from time, category, and comparison charts to tree maps and custom maps. You can connect your mobile reports to a range of data sources, including on-premises SQL Server and analysis services data. You're going to end up laying out your mobile reports on a design surface 
with adjusting grid rows and columns, and flexible mobile report elements that scale well to any screen size. You'll then save these mobile reports to a reporting services server and view and interact with them in a browser or in the Power BI mobile app on iPads, iPhones, Android phones and tablets, and Windows devices. If you like, at this time, you can go ahead and close out of Visual Studio and Report Builder as we can't use those apps to create mobile reports. We're gonna get started in SSMS by locating and copying the mobile query. Now there are two mobile queries in here. There's mobile query and mobile query by year. You'll be accessing the one with by year shortly. But for right now, we want to locate mobile query and select and copy it to your clipboard. And then we're going to switch over to SSRS. We're going to be creating a new data set by going to the new dropdown and choosing data set and go ahead and open report builder. We're going to use our regular shared sales information data source and go ahead and click create. On the ribbon, you're going to select the edit as text icon and paste your mobile query in and go ahead and run the query by using the red exclamation mark. So you can see it has total transactions by order date and also by order year, or it displays the year of the order date as well. We can go ahead and save this data set. We want to put it in the SSRS video course folder and we're going to call it mobile data. And save. And you can close it. You can go ahead and get rid of that. We're opening report builder pop up. And you may have to refresh your screen in order to see the data set. And when you do refresh, you'll see your data set. Now that we've created our mobile data set, I'm going to give you a challenge and have you create another one based on a different query on your own. So the query that you're going to want to grab in Management Studio is the mobile data by year query. You go ahead and copy that on to your clipboard. And then you're going to come back here and use your new drop down and select data set. Navigate to report builder. And you're still going to be using the shared data source. So go on and complete creating that data set and name it mobile data by year. When you're done with it, you can resume the video. And when you're done, we're going to click on the mobile data by year tile. And up at the top, we're going to select edit and report builder. And go ahead and reopen report builder. And let's run it from within here. So notice how the years are not in order. We're going to add to this query underneath your group by clause. You're going to type order by and then year. And now run it again. So the order by is the sort sorting clause. And now the years are in order. We're going to save it so that that sort is saved and we're going to close it. And then you can go back using the breadcrumb trail to your SSRS video course folder. 
Now we're going to tour the mobile report publisher before designing our mobile reports. So I'm going to access it from the search box and I'm going to just type mobile and it comes up on the list and I'm going to launch it. So when it launches, I'm going to give you a tour of the interface and we'll start at the top where it has a title bar and to the left of the title bar, you have several new icons. So it opens with like a blank mobile report, just kind of like when you open word, you get a blank document. But if you wanted to create a new one from within here, you can start by doing that first icon. Then you can open a mobile report, save and save as. You also have a server connections icon up there on the left. Underneath that, and I'm going to be in the main body of the screen, you can name your mobile report from where it says new mobile report. And to the right, it lets you know how many grid rows and grid columns it is showing. In my case, it's five rows and 10 columns. To the right of that, there's a drop down, and you can see the three views. We, by default, are in master view. This is normally where you want to do your design work. The next view I'm going to select is tablet. Notice the grid is not as wide. And I'm going to go back and select phone. And you can see what that phone grid looks like. We're going to go back to the drop down and select master. Now to the right of the view drop down, you have a color palette drop down that you can access to apply some coloration to your reports. On the left side, you have a panel that has four tabs. By default, you come in here on the layout tab, and this is where all of your graphics are located, your charts, and they're in different groupings. So it starts with navigators and then gauges, charts, group comes next as I scroll down and then I'll see the maps group and data grids group. So these are the types of visualizations that you can use to graphically represent your data in a mobile report. The next tab is the data tab, which is not really populated right now, when we're building our report, we'll be coming to this tab and you'll see on the upper right corner, there's three icons. This is where you can add data so you can connect it to your data source, refresh all the data or export all the data. And you'll see this, what it looks like when it's populated in just a bit. The settings tab, you can title your report from here. You can select your three letter currency code, the start of your fiscal year, the first day of the week, and the effective date applies to time navigators and time charts. So if it's not set, the current date is used. So you can put in a date that's not today in order to make it the effective date for a time navigator or chart. And finally, at the bottom, it has a check mark for enabling client data caching. And then you have the preview tab, which is where you go to view your report once it's designed. So I've closed my instance of the mobile report publisher and come back to SSRS because there's another way that you can launch it, just like another way you can launch Report Builder. So this time we're going to use our new drop down and choose mobile report and we'll let it open the publisher for us. And so we're going to start by jumping into module 11, where we're going to design our mobile reports. And before we do so, we want to make sure that we have our right server connection. So the last icon up here on a little toolbar, server connections. I'm checking and it looks like I'm going to click on edit so I can see the full thing. And I am on the one that I need to be on. 
If you not, you can either add a new one or like we're doing right now, edit the existing one. And then you would choose connect. We're going to start by adding our first visualization to this report grid and underneath charts in the layout tab. The first one is a time chart. I'm going to click and hold on it and drag it up to the upper left grid box. And a couple of things happened when we did that. First, at the bottom of your screen, a visual properties panel opened for that time chart. Secondly, if you look, and this is really more attached to the grid, the gear, you'll notice when I'm on any of the grid boxes, the gear is there. And from that gear, I can delete, cut, copy, paste, redo, and undo. So the first thing we're going to do is resize this visualization. I'm going to use the bottom right hand corner, click and hold, and I want it to be three columns wide and three rows tall. Now, if you take a look at the values and the years in that preview kind of of the chart, you'll notice that they are not connected to our data set. In Wide World Importers, we go from January 1st, 2013 to May 31st, 2016. So this is simulated table data because we haven't connected it to our data set yet. We're going to do that now. Let's go over to the data tab. Now on the data tab, you'll see the report elements. We only have one, our time chart, and we'll see what's known as a simulated table of data. And if you look down at the bottom in the data properties pane, you're only seeing one tab and that's for the simulated table because we haven't yet connected it to our data set. So what we're going to do in the upper right hand corner is we're going to add data and you can add data for a mobile report from Excel directly or from report server. In our case, we're going to choose report server. So now you're going to select the server and you're going to select your folder. And we're going to grab our mobile data data set. So now if you look at the bottom of your screen in the data property section first, you'll notice you have two tabs, one for simulated data and one for your mobile data. And that's the one that it's on and it's showing data from our data set. To the right of the mobile data tab, you have that same gear so you can remove it, so on and so forth. You even have the ability to export it to Excel from there if you want it to. Now let's go back to the layout tab for a moment. And you'll notice that the values and the years have not changed, even though we've just connected to our data set. So let's head back to the data tab to address that. And we're going to address it in the data properties pane. So where it says main series, it's still on the simulated table. We're going to select the drop down and choose mobile data. And now we can go back to layout view. And now you'll see that the time chart has updated using the data from our data set. So now we're going to change the chart title from time chart one. And just so you know, it's not really a text box placeholder that you can get into. And you could literally click until the cows come home. Down here is where you can change the title and the visual properties. So we're going to call it all sales. Now we're going to select the number gauge visualization and we're going to place it in the grid underneath our time chart and we're going to expand it. So it's three columns wide and two rows tall. We're going to change the title 
to all sales. And we're going to go over to the number format visual property and change it to currency with decimals. Now we're going to scroll to the top in our layout pane and we're going to grab the time navigator and drop it to the right of the time chart. We're going to expand it to the right by two rows. Now we're going to add a chart data grid. So I'm going to scroll to the bottom in the layout pane to the data grid section, and I'm going to grab the chart data grid and drag it underneath the time navigator. And I'm expanding it to be three columns wide and four rows tall. And now we're going to go down and change the title of the chart data grid in visual properties. And it's going to be sales by order date. Now over to the right, you'll see a row numbers property and we're going to do the drop down and select hide. So if you want, you can do the drop down and select show and it adds row numbers. We don't want them to show at all. So we're going to set it to hide. And we're going to go to the data set via the data tab. And we want to make sure that we select both. So we have data for the grid view and reference data for the chart visualizations. We want both of those to be mobile data. If you look to the right, you'll see a data grid column section. And from here, you can change the order of the columns in the data grid. You can add another column, add a chart column, so on and so forth. We want the order year to be in the first position. So in front of it, that gray box, I'm going to put my mouse on it and just drag order year up above order date. And then we'll have order year, order date, and total transaction amount in that order. Now at this point, let's go ahead and go to preview and see where we are with our report. So the cool thing about the time navigator is this in the time navigator, if I click on 2013, the other charts update it to just show me 2013. If I go back to the left of the navigator and click on all, everything goes back to all. Pretty cool. So time navigators are really cool. And it doesn't seem to be working on the order year column here, maybe because of it's how that is formatted. But let's do the back arrow to the left of new mobile report to get out of preview. So back on the bottom of the data tab in the data properties group, we're going to go over to the right where it has the data grid columns, and we're going to choose the options button next to order year. And you'll notice it has a string format of general. We're going to do the drop down there. And at the very bottom, we're going to select none. And we're going to choose done. Now, if we go back to layout view, we'll see that the order year is now in the appropriate format. Now that we fixed the format on the order year, I can tell you that that is still not going to resolve the issue with it not responding to the time navigator. Let's go back to preview. And in your time navigator, click on 2015. Now you'll notice that all of the reports kind of update it, right? But the problem with the grid is this. Let's go back. And we need to go back to the data tab for that grid. 
And I'm going to go back to layout view and I'm going to name this new mobile report. I'm just going to call it all sales report. Let's apply a theme to this. So in the upper right hand corner, the last button, choose a theme that you can live with. I think I'll go with the spa theme and you see how it impacts your report. Now we're going to create two more views, a phone and a tablet view. So we're going to go to the view dropdown and select tablet. Now on the left, you'll see auto report elements and you have to place them on the tablet grid. This is what my phone view would look like. And now I'm going to go back to master view. And it's time for us to save this report to the report server. So go ahead and choose your save icon at the top. So you can save mobile reports locally or to the server. We're going to choose save to server. So it's going to save it to the root, to the home of my server. And under location, I'm going to choose browse and choose SSRS video course. And we're just going to leave it out there in that folder. So we're going to select choose folder and then save. So now that we've published our mobile report to the report server, you'll see there's a category mobile reports and there's your report. Now it can be accessed by clicking on it from the browser, but typically it's going to be accessed from a mobile device, a phone or a tablet. So let's go back to the SSRS video course folder using the breadcrumb trail and you'll see what it would look like in your Power BI mobile app in just a little while. But for right now, we're going to add another component. When you view mobile reports in the Power BI mobile app on your mobile device, you can view mobile reports as well as KPIs. So we're going to create a KPI. We're going to start in Management Studio where we're going to construct a very short query to extract data from a table that we're going to use as our data set for our KPI. So if you're not familiar with SQL queries, I'll walk you through this and explain it as we go. The first thing we're going to do is look at the entire contents of the table to get familiar with what we're looking for. And we're going to do control and the letter N to open a new query window. And you're going to type select. So the select keyword is typically used to describe which fields you want shown in your query results. We want to see all of the fields from a particular table. So we're going to type an asterisk, which represents all fields. Then we're going to type the keyword from, which is used to indicate which table you want to see all of the fields from. So we have a table that starts with the word sales. And as soon as I start typing that, it shows up on the list. So I can just grab it from the list. And then it's followed by a dot. So there are several tables in this database that start with the word sales followed by the dot notation. And the table we're interested in is the sales.customer transactions table. So I'm just using my down arrow to highlight it and I can tab it in. And now I can press F5 to execute the query. And we're seeing everything that's in the sales.customer transactions table in our results. So in the results list, the fields that we're going to be interested in for our KPI data set are going to be the amount excluding tax field. 
and let me highlight that one for you in the data set. And we're also going to be interested in the transaction date field. Now, there are two other fields that we want in the results for the KPI that are not included in this table result. And you'll see how that works when we build the query. So remember 2016 is the year in the database that only has data for five months. And we're gonna base our KPI off of that. And so we specifically are gonna want the year of the transaction date. We're also gonna want to extract the month of the transaction date as well in this. So we're gonna want the sum of the amount excluding tax and both the year and the month of the transaction date, as well as two other fields that are not included in the table for our KPI. So now we're ready to write the query with the specific fields that we want and add the two fields that are not in the results set here. And so we're going to do what's called commenting out that select all statement. So you can keep it in here and it will not execute when we run the query that we're getting ready to write. So I'm going to click in front of the word select and type a double dash. And notice how it turns the whole line green, which means it's a comment line. And at the end of it, I can type a description. So you can remember what it's doing. It is selecting, I'll just do a dash there, selecting all fields in a specific table. And then I'm gonna press enter. So now we're gonna type the keyword select. Now, typically when I have multiple fields that I want selected, I like to type the from statement first before I list the fields. And that way, when I'm typing the field list, the field will show and I don't have to type the whole thing. So a great way to avoid typos. So I'm gonna press enter and type from. And the table, same reference we used before, it starts with the word sales, which shows up on the list. You have the dot notation and you can pick customer transactions from the list. And then we're gonna go up to the select line and type a space after select. So we want the sum of the amount excluding tax. So we're gonna use the sum aggregate and then an open parenthesis. Now, this is a little trick as well. If I start typing amount excluding tax, it's not showing up on the list. However, if I close the parentheses and then go back in between it and I start typing, then I get my field list. And I'm gonna press the end key to get out of the closing parentheses. So, we want the sum of the amount excluding tax. And because if we don't give it an alias as the column name, it would just give us the sum and the column name would be blank. So we're gonna give it an alias by using the as keyword, and we're gonna just call it total sales, all mushed together. If you're doing aliases with multiple words with spaces in between, they need to be enclosed in single quotes. And now we're gonna press enter. We're gonna type a comma because we're ready for our next field here. I usually put the comma at the beginning of the line. So if I have to delete something, I don't have a comma just hanging out there that could cause me an error. People do their coding any way they want to, but this is just how I do it. So the next line, we want to extract the year of the transaction date field. So I'm gonna type the year function and it will show up on the list. And then in parentheses, and I'm gonna type an open and closing one and then go in between them and start typing transaction date and you will see it on your list. 
come outside of the parenthesis. And we're going to give that an alias as well. So we're going to use the as keyword and we're going to just call it transaction year and enter. Now we're going to pull the month of the transaction date. So comma and the month function, and we're going to do the same field transaction date. So you can get that in there and make sure you're outside of the closing paren and you're going to type as transaction month. So we're just giving column headings here for the parts of the date that we are extracting. We're going to press enter at the end of that line and another comma. And so we're going to type the number one as, and we're going to name it KPI status. So this is a field that we're including in the results that does not appear in this table. So we're kind of creating it just for this query. And so we're going to press enter and we have our next comma and we're going to type 50 million, no punctuation as KPI goal. So KPI key performance indicator allows you to measure where you are with where you want to be. And so we added two fields that are not included in this table that we don't want included in the table. We just want them in the query. And that is the KPI status and KPI goal fields. Now we need to come underneath the from line so we can finish this up. So we want to apply a filter. Right? So this data from this table goes from January 1st, 2013 through May 31st, 2016. We're only interested in the 2016 data. So we're going to use the where keyword as a filter, and then we're going to type year, the year function, and in parentheses, you're going to get in transaction date again. and come outside to parentheses, And then you're going to type equals 2016. So we're only interested in the results from 2016. Enter. Then we're going to use the group by clause. And I'll explain this after we get this one in. So group by, and we're going to use year transaction date again. Now at this point, you can go up to your select statement and select year transaction date. We don't need the as piece, the alias declaration, and you can copy it and then paste it after group by. And then you're going to type a comma and you can go up to your select statement and grab month transaction date, copy that and paste it after the comma in the group by line. So we want the organization of this data to be by year and by month. And we have one more line. We want to sort it. So we're going to use the order by clause underneath the group by clause and go ahead and it's still on your clipboard, paste the month of the transaction date there. So we want it in order by month, one, two, three, four, five. It's only five months that we have of data in 2016. So now you can press F5 to execute this query and you'll see the total sales, the transaction year, which are all 2016, transaction month, KPI status and goal are the same as the values we assign to them in the select statement for each record. And we're going to go ahead and save this query. So I'm going to right click on the tab and choose save SQL query six. 
I'm going to navigate to my code snippets and I'm going to put it in here where my other code snippets from the Word document ended up when we saved them. And we're going to call this KPI query. In SSMS, we're going to go ahead and select our KPI query. So we don't need to select the commented outline at the top and then copy it to your clipboard. And then we're going to go over to the web portal. So from the portal, go ahead and create a new data set and name it KPI 2016. So we're going to create a key performance indicator that's going to communicate the amount of progress we made toward our goal. And our goal we set was 50 million for 2016. Key performance indicators are very valuable. They allow you to evaluate quickly the progress made against measurable goals and give you time in some instances to readjust your strategy so you can meet those goals in the future. We're going to go to our new drop down in the portal and we're going to select KPI. The first thing you are going to notice is there's a preview. There's some manually set values, static values that are in here. And the preview is currently based on that. It will update as we start managing the build of our KPI. And we're going to name this 2016 KPI. And on the right side, we're going to start with the value field. So instead of set manually, which is the default, we're going to use a data set field. You're going to do the ellipsis, navigate to the folder and pick your KPI 2016 data set. And we want to use the total sales field here. So I'm going to do that option button. Now notice the aggregation is set to first. We actually want a sum of total sales for this field. So I'm going to do the drop down to the right of first and choose the sum aggregation and click OK. So notice it populates, right, with the name of the data set and the field with that dot notation. And also you'll see that the preview has updated as well. So now we're going to set the goal and that's used as a comparison and shown as a percent difference. And we're also going to use a data set field for that. So we're going to go ahead and select the drop down data set field. We're going to do the ellipsis, navigate to our KPI 2016 data set. And the KPI goal is the one that we're going to use. Now that's a field that's not in the database, but we created it just for the query. And we only need to use the first one. It's the same number repeating. We certainly don't want it to do any kind of sum or average on that. So we're going to leave the aggregation to first and we're going to click OK. The next one is the status. We're going to use a data set field. And the status is a numerical value used to determine the tile color in the KPI. Valid values are one, which is green, zero, amber, and negative one, which would be red. And we're going to use a data set field. So we're going to navigate to our data set. And KPI status is the field that we also created that's not in the database. And we're going to leave that on the first aggregation as well because it's just repeating the same number. Click OK. Now we have our trend set. These are comma separated numeric values or semicolon separated numeric values used for chart visualization. So we have values in our data set that represent the trend. So we're going to go to data set trend and the ellipsis, make your way to your data set. And we're going to use total sales again. Now notice there's not an aggregation at the top. It's going to review each line item total sale which is what we need it to do. And we'll click OK. 
So if you look at our preview, you'll notice that the number is so large that it's kind of cutting off. So at the very top on the right, you're going to go to the general dropdown under value format and choose abbreviated. So now you can see the abbreviated number 22.6 million, and it's at negative 55% of where we need to be. But again, this is only reviewing five months of the year. Now down at the bottom, you have your different visualization types. I'm going to leave it on the bar chart. And underneath that, you have related content. Let's do that drop down. So you can relate it to a custom URL or to a mobile report. If you relate it to a custom URL, when a user clicks on the KPI, it will take them to that URL. The same for a mobile report. Let's choose mobile report and you're gonna choose your all sales report. So let's imagine we're in 2016 and we're in May. Well, actually we're at almost at the end of June. As soon as the June information is entered into the database, your KPI will automatically update just like everything else. It will automatically refresh. So we're gonna go ahead and click create. And now we have a category called KPIs and there's our KPI. Because we listed our mobile report as related content for our KPI, if we click on our KPI in the browser, right, we'll notice that at the bottom it's showing a thumbnail of the mobile report. And if we click on that thumbnail, it will show the mobile report. And it works that way on the Power BI mobile app on your mobile device as well. So back in module seven, we registered with Power BI. Well, I showed you how you could register with Power BI and Report Server Configuration Manager so that you have some functionality between the two. And that would give you the ability to see Power BI reports here in SSRS web portal. Well, there's some another step to that to be effective. If you go to the gear in the upper right hand corner and you go to my settings, this is where individual users can sign into their individual Power BI accounts so that they'll be able to pen paginated report items from here to their Power BI dashboards. So your end users can sign into their own accounts by using my settings here in the browser. So what I have here is a slide that points you to a step-by-step -step guide on how to access your SSRS mobile reports on a mobile device. So your tablet or your phone, and it's using that Power BI mobile app. And so it will give you how to connect to the server, the article here that you can be connected to up to five report servers at the same time. And you'll be able to see your mobile reports and your KPIs in the mobile app. So what we're gonna do here is show you a screenshot of what it would look like if you were viewing it on your phone. So here's just an example of where you would see your KPIs, your mobile reports from on your phone. And if you've related your KPIs to certain mobile reports, once you click on the KPI on your mobile device, you can also access the mobile report on your device, just like you can in the browser. So we've completed the course and I've ran module 10 and 11 together. So I'm gonna just review what we recently covered. Module 10 was your introduction to mobile reports. You got an overview of mobile reports. We prepared some data for mobile reports. So we created a data set and you got a tour of the mobile report publisher interface. In module 11, we developed mobile reports. So we designed a mobile report, we published it, and we accessed it in the web portal. 
And then we went ahead and created a KPI. But before that, you actually got to create a SQL query for the data set that we use for the KPI. Once we had both created and related to each other, you saw that you were able to select the KPI and see a thumbnail of the mobile report and actually access the mobile report from that thumbnail. Thank you for attending the SSRS video course. In conclusion, what did we cover? In module nine, we got to extend reporting services by utilizing e expressions and embedded code. And then we actually created a class library project where we could store our reusable code, gave our code some minor modifications that made it appropriate to use as a custom assembly, and then we created and used our custom assembly. In module 10, you were introduced to mobile reports. You had an overview of mobile reports. And then we prepared data for mobile reports by creating our data set. And you got an overview of the mobile report publisher interface. And our last module, we designed, published, and accessed our mobile reports. Well, at least we were able to, during the class, access it in SSRS, but you can also access it from your Power BI app on your mobile device. Thanks for watching. Don't forget we also offer live classes in office applications, professional development, and private training. Visit learnit.com for more details. Please remember to like and subscribe and let us know your thoughts in the comments. Thank you for choosing Learnit.